Good evening. This is the regular city council meeting for June 3rd, 2020. For the record, council members Williamson, Rural, Espiro, Darling, McAllister, and Grote are present. We will now rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Does council have any announcements? Um, Mr. Mayor, yeah, I have a question concerning COVID updates. Are we going to have time for that today, or would be now be the time to create yeah, questions? Yeah, if you have questions. Um, my question is concerning um, this contact tracing stuff that I've heard about. What is the city's stance on that, or what's what are we? What what is up with that? Did so we don't. We don't have any agreements. We're not involved in any contract tracing, contact tracing, excuse me. So we've had some questions from uh, the public. So okay. thank you for asking about it. But um, we've had a couple of records requests that have come in and in that regard, we've responded to those and we don't have any records because we're not doing anything right. relative to contact tracing or have Police had department any. has no, no enforcement. Okay. Great. Nope. And we have had no conversations with anyone about contact tracing. I think that's in the public health realm. Okay. So it's not been in a government realm, at least for us. That's great. Thank you. Council, any other announcements? Okay. Staff? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to ask the police chief to, to come up. Um, we're going to get through a couple of his items and then I'm on to yours, Tim, too. So um, to give an update, we've had questions about the 4th of July um, celebration and kind of where that is relative to permitting and, and things like that. So I'll have uh, Chief Kuhn start to address that. And then I believe Steve and, and Ron, the organizers are here. So um, we're going to have them and work it under our staff update. Just give you kind of a brief update on where that is. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I won't sit. So with the concerns of what's going on with Fourth of July and what is and what isn't happening, we thought we'd invite Ron, he's really the primary organizer of that event, to kind of come in and give like a five minute overview of where they're at, uh, what their plans are, what their goals are, their objectives for Fourth of July celebration. You, now I don't know what the speaker's probably going to be here, right? It, it would be so helpful. We have a mic so you can, get, can, you, can, you, can you can sit. <laughs> Comfy chairman. Uh, my name is Ron Corn. Um, I'm the one that pulled the permits and all for the Sandpoint Independence Day. And uh, I was asked to come here by the chief to give a brief description on where we're at. It's been a very fast, fulfilling ride. We started this about three weeks ago. And in that three weeks, we've been able to raise enough money to pay for the parade. Um, we've raised enough money to pay for our picnic festival after the parade. And we raised enough money to pay for the fireworks show. Um, all thank you to the community. That's what it's all about. Um, permits uh, have been turned in. Money has been paid. Uh, traffic court has been turned in to the city. Um, their plan for road closures and all. We uh, talked to the chief about possibly uh, restaging, moving the staging area from the west side of Fifth Avenue to the south side of Pine Street. And that way we do not have to close down Fifth Avenue anymore. It was a state highway which cost a lot of money, created a lot of uh, problems for traffic and everything else going through. So now we're going to be staging on 4th and Pine, headed towards Memorial Park Field. Um, what else can I tell you? We've got a lot of events planned for the festival, bringing back old fashioned for the July to Sandpoint. Um, water seat, watermelon seat spinning contest, three legged races, wheel well races, water balloon tosses, all that kind of stuff. Thumb tank, uh, we're looking for volunteers for the thumb tank. You would like to step up, help. Uh, parade's gonna start at 10 like it did before. Um, basically the same parade route as before, except we're starting on 4th and Church instead of 5th and Church, because of the way we're coming in across Pine Street. 
It'll continue along the same parade route as it did before, and it'll end at Cedar and Fifth. People are just dispersing there. Um, festival starts at noon officially and goes till five officially. We could have a large turnout, so whatever happens from there, happens. Um, we're looking at other parking lots to use. We're looking at uh, possibly using a shuttle, maybe high school parking lot like the festival does to get people shuttled over there. So it's a little more organized on the parking. Um, fireworks, same as before. We're using the same fireworks contractor as the Lions did. Um, so nothing should change there. It should be the same fireworks show as last year. Um, maybe I should just open up the questions and see if there's anything that I missed. I'm interested in the fireworks. Yeah. A lot of people are interested. In yeah, fireworks. so it'll be at uh, City Beach again. So, so just kind of make the assumption that it's similar to the years past. It should be the same show basically as we had last year. Any other questions or concerns? We have not issued, so we're still in the process of reviewing all of the information and the permitting and working through details, which is typical with um, most of our larger events. Uh, I think we might still be waiting for documentation I knew this morning on insurance, but that may have changed today. Right. Um, You're, we're still waiting. We have a couple of policies that are available to us right now. We're just trying to review and invite the best one that we can. So, so that's required in order for us to, to um, finish um, moving through our permitting processing. But um, we've had uh, at least one meeting with um, all of us involved in special event planning and, and coordination on what this would look like and requirements. And um, I know there's almost daily conversations with Mary who functions as our special events coordinator and probably the chief too. So we've had a few questions about his permit issued and it's, it's in process. I'd just like to thank the city for supporting us and making sure that we keep our workers alive as they move forward. Perfect. Good. All right. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. You guys, as you know, I don't want to stick around if you don't want. Thank you. We just wanted to have you come in for a minute. Um, just to add a little bit to that, what are the con what are the concerns as we were staffing it? You heard uh, Ron talk about the route change just a little bit. Um, there is a big cost for that organization line to focus both on Fifth Avenue because it is a state highway. There's some huge detours that come with that. Uh, we spent several hours with them trying to come up with different ideas and different plans to try to how to keep it as normal as possible with that route down church first and cedar and so they came up with the idea a week or two weeks ago about starting that event coming in on for the church so it'll almost function like it did before which allows us to stage some still there on, on church street some on fourth street and then shutting down pine street will have a will have an impact but won't be as bad of an impact as it is in shutting down the fifth avenue We've got a lot of the kinks worked out. I know there's still some kinks we have to address before the, the fourth, but uh, we're moving in the right direction at least. Mr. Mag? Yes. Um, and are we considering as we um, go through the permits and such, the governor's regulation to stages of opening and maximum size of crowds and social distancing, is that all being considered as a part of the permitting process? Correct, our permit would require, um, would require uh, social distancing protocols okay. built in and followed. Um, and um, in terms of crowd size, by the 4th of July, the anticipation would be that we are in stage four, which allows for large crowd gatherings again. Okay, and if we are not, if the governor decides to hold back and not open, progress forward to stage four, do we have a plan in place to deal we'll with that? have to build that into the conditions of the permit. Okay. 
Any other questions on the 4th of July events? So with that, on the other side of the announcements for the police department, I know there's been a lot of questions, concerns uh, coming up to yesterday's uh, uh, March with our with our youth, kind of how that happened, um, kind of what is the police department doing, the other concerns that uh, may be coming to our town. So I thought I'd just spend just a couple minutes um, Oh, maybe clear up some rules, rumors, or give you some, some of the stuff that we're doing in the police department to make sure the community is safe. Um, so if you if you haven't been on social media uh, lately, uh, to be to be frank, we get a, a ton of a ton of rumors that are circulating around about hate groups that are coming to our community, uh, marches. <laughs> Is that better? Not really. <laughs> Can you turn? Just swallow it. Swallow it. <laughs> How close do I have to get it? Don't choke. Is that better? I will. I will try to yell a little bit louder. I don't like. I'm. We're used to not yelling, so I will. I will. So anyway, so what I was saying is, one of the concerns that we've had is trying to monitor all the rumors that we've had on social media and that are coming in the police department with uh, hate groups that are coming and potentially coming to the Sandpoint area. Um, just I wanted the council to understand and even the public to understand what we've done as a police department. So in the last couple of days, every time we get those rumors, we try to vet those to see if they're actually a credible threat or if it's truly just a rumor that's out there. Uh, today, I've been on the phone with local agencies in our county, um, in Kootenai County, with those agencies. I've also been on the phone with the FBI who monitors those groups. I've been speaking with the FBI as of probably a couple hours ago. There is no credible threat or any evidence right now that we have any of those groups that are coming to Sandpoint right now. Um, those, those, those hate groups really like to look for events that are already established. And they look for ones that are already organized and then they try to infiltrate those, those events that are already planned. Uh, we don't have any current planned events that are permitted. And in speaking of the FBI, one of the things that they said that they really look for is events that are permitted through cities that give them time to plan. Um, like our event yesterday, uh, there was really no planning that went through. There was an event process. It was some uh, teenagers and some of some adults on our Snapchat that started that event. And so a lot of those last minute, which were you know, given time for a hate group to come up and participate in that. With that being said, we still have to be diligent and what we're doing to try to look at all those rumors, vet them to find out if they're credible or not credible. So as of as of a few hours ago, there is nothing credible that's coming to Sandpoint. Nor was there anything credible last night. Nor last, thank you, Meryl, nor mm -hmm. anything credible last night for that event too. Uh, we do have a, if you've been on social media, we do have a potential March coming up this week. Um, now that there's no permits issued for it, there's nothing that'll be uh, permitted as of today. And so those groups that are looking for those online permits that they're searching won't see it. So one of the, one of the things we'll do is we'll actually stall our permitting process on those till the last minute. So it gives them less time to, to organize. One of the concerns with, with yesterday's event was the armed, the armed men and women that came down to, to stand guard and protection of our community. It's important to understand that just like each and every one of us have our first amendment right to, to free speech and to free assemble, um, those have that, those, the other groups have that same right uh, to bear arms and to be able to, to walk around. So it's a, it's a balancing act that we have from law enforcement to make sure that we're supporting not only the first amendment rights of those that are wanting to come and, and protest and march peacefully and those that wanna bear arms. So. Uh, yesterday, I think in the end was it was a success. I think there were some concerns from our community because they weren't ready or prepared for for that. So, um, you guys got any questions that you you have concerns or anything I may have missed that you want to clarify? Perfect, um, Corey. I I, I want to. I've got some. Uh, well, first, let me ask: Is there anything else from staff? Uh, yes, we have another presentation on another topic. Okay, so. I'll, I'll come back to that. Thank you for that presentation, okay. Chief. Appreciate it. <laughs> Go ahead. Our last update is Tim Woodruff. On he, this will be an update from his update at last council meeting regarding uh, the goose permit. So, and plans for this year. Thank you, Jennifer, Mayor and Council. 
I wanted to let you know that as of today, just a couple hours ago, the permits are all in place with U.S. Fish and Game, uh, Department of Ag, and authorization from Idaho Fish and Game for relocation. Uh, the capture and relocation schedule is for the morning of Thursday, June 25th, probably pretty early in the morning, uh, and will involve city staff, Department of Ag staff, and Idaho Fish and Game. The banding will be under the license of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, the relocation site was selected by Idaho Fish and Game as, and is at the southeast side of Port Lane Chain Lakes about 90 miles away. I also want to let you know that we've been working uh, the dog with Randy the handler. Uh, we've been out about six times. Uh, the About three of the times we were successful in relocating the geese, three of them they they were on strike and didn't, didn't want to leave. So that's kind of where we're at right now. We're still working at other alternative options and continuing to, to not close any doors. Uh, but the relocation, I think, was a great success from my perspective last season. Uh, again, as I briefed you last time, about uh, for a couple of weeks, we didn't have any geese at the beach. And then the ones that did return uh, were a lot different behavior. Uh, uh, when we relocate them and the families of the it's during the molt is when we capture them. And, and then uh, when we relocate them, uh, the, the, the young ones can't fly until about mid to late August. So uh, when they are, are at the beach and have been in the years past, they truly are captive. They can't go anywhere else. And so uh, now when they did, did come back, the ones even that were banded were mobile and able to uh, fly away and not just hang out at the beach. So questions that we any questions, Council? Thanks, Kim. Appreciate that. Anything else? For staff so, updates, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Um, I have uh, something I'd like to talk about as well, and it, and it relates to uh, what Corey was, what the police chief was presenting on um, in terms of uh, the armed people uh, downtown yesterday, as well as the protesters. Um, I partic participated in that um, activity. I was part of the march with the high school students. And, um, and I just want to focus on that for a little bit because I've had a ton of emails, messages, phone calls through, through last night and through today, um, people that are just really concerned, um, they're frightened um, in the midst of what's going on around the rest of the nation right now. Um, people have a legitimate reason to be concerned and uh, for, for the um, you know, public safety in their community as well as um, you know, I think maybe before yesterday, it seemed like, oh, that could never happen here in Sandpoint. And then, you know, it feels pretty like a pretty dramatic change when people walk outside of their business. So they go downtown with their family to have dinner last night and they pass, you know, a couple dozen heavily armed people. So um, that's not something that we're accustomed to seeing here in this community. Um, I think for many people, it's uh, at least shocking and, and even uh, terrifying. Um, so I just want to call attention to that and, and you know, I understand um, that the intent behind um, those who, who came um, and, and uh, you know, were, were bearing arms and, you know, obviously it's within their constitutional right to, to open carry in Idaho. Um, uh, but, you know, just because it's legal, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right responsible thing to do. Um, and um, I want to talk a little bit more about that and, and why I feel that um, that we can do better as a community. But I think it's really important. I want to share this um, statement that came out today from James Mattis, who is the U.S. Uh, he's a U.S. Marine Corps General and Secretary of Defense under Donald Trump. And I think his statement is a really powerful statement that speaks to how important it is as a society, as Americans, to come together right now around this country and in solidarity um, now while we can because um, the, the events that are happening around the country and are spilling over in, even into communities like right here in Sandpoint, um, they can pose a real threat um, to our well-being. And so I think this is really worth hearing. In Union, there is strength. I have watched this week's unfolding events, angry and appalled. The words equal justice under law are carved in the pediment of the United States Supreme Court. This is precisely what protesters are rightly demanding. It is a wholesome and unifying demand, one that all of us should be able to get behind. We must not be distracted by a small number of lawbreakers.
The protests are defined by tens of thousands of people of conscience who are insisting that we live up to our values, our values as people and our values as a nation. When I joined the military some 50 years ago, I swore an, or an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Never did I dream that troops taking that same oath would be ordered under any circumstance to violate the constitutional rights of their fellow citizens, much less to provide a bizarre photo op for the elected commander in chief with military leadership standing alongside. We must reject any thinking of our cities as, as a battle space that our uniformed military is called upon to dominate. At home, we should use our military only when requested to do so on very rare occasions by state governors militarizing our response as we witnessed in Washington DC sets up a conflict, a false conflict between the military and civilian society. It erodes the moral ground that ensures a trusted bond between men and women in uniform and the society they are sworn to protect and of which they themselves are a part. Keeping public order rests with civilian state and local leaders who best understand their communities and are answerable to them. James Madison wrote in Federalist 14 that America united with a handful of troops or without a single soldier exhibits a more forbidding posture to foreign ambition than America disunited. With 100,000 veterans ready for combat, we do not need to militarize our response to protests. We need to unite around a common purpose, and it starts by guaranteeing that all of us are equal before the law. Instructions given by the military departments to our troops before the Normandy invasion reminded soldiers that the Nazi slogan for destroying us was divide and conquer. Our American answer is in union there is strength. We must summon that unity to surmount this crisis, confident that we are better than our politics. Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite the American people does not even pretend to try. Instead, he tries to divide us. We are witnessing the consequences of three years of this deliberate effort. We are witnessing the consequences of three years without mature leadership. We can unite without him, drawing on the strengths inherent in our civil society. This will not be easy. As the past few days have shown, as the past few days have shown, but we owe it to our fellow citizens, to past generations, that bled to defend our promise and to our children. We can come through this trying time stronger and with a renewed sense of purpose and respect for one another. The pandemic has shown us that it is not only our troops who are willing to offer the ultimate sacrifice for the safety of the community. Americans in hospitals, grocery stores, post offices, and elsewhere have put their lives on the line in order to serve their fellow citizens and their country. We know that we are better than the abuse of executive authority that we witnessed in Lafayette Square. We must reject and hold accountable those in our office who would make a mockery of our constitution. At the same time, we must remember Lincoln's better angels and listen to them as we work to unite. Only by adopting a new path, which means in truth, returning to the original path of our founding ideals, will we again be a country admired and respected at home and abroad. So I think that's really relevant even to us right here in Sandpoint. You know, we're not faced with federal troops coming in right now. Um, what we do have is we have a, a bunch of civilians, heavily armed, who, who have the right, many of them, I know, I've spoken with many of them last night at, at the march, many of them have the good intentions of wanting to protect their community. They wanna protect property, and, and they wanna protect their right to practice the First Amendment. That's their intention. But I think what's really important to recognize and acknowledge and for us as a community to discuss is that there's a big difference between what our intention is and what our impact is. And why, while they may have the best of intentions, the reality of the matter is many in our community were dramatically impacted last night and will continue to be dramatically impacted so long as we have heavily armed groups of people marching up and down our city streets. When there is no credible threat, when there is nothing to protect us from, 
we have a highly qualified and accountable police force that I have complete faith in and confidence in under the leadership of Chief Kuhn, who's been fantastic for the city for forever and ever, at least six, six years, maybe something like that. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Um, we've got a great team and, and they get it right pretty much every time. And, you know, nobody's perfect all the time, um, but, but we have a lot of, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of protocols that we have in place that, that allow, that require accountability of our police force and, and, and they live up to it. Um, that includes things like body cams. All of our uh, police officers have body cams. They have car cameras. Uh, they have, they all go through regular training for mental health uh, policing uh, so that we are, are, so that our officers are prepared to deal um, with people who have mental conditions, uh, de-escalation training, as well as just um, community policing, how to bring the appropriate amount of force to the situation, not bring a whole bunch of fully automatic weapons when there's a bunch of kids, you know, unarmed who are just, you know, speaking out because they care about justice in our society. It's, it's just unnecessary. And the difference that I'm talking about is while in, the intent might have been righteous, the impact was harmful. It was harmful to those kids. They didn't feel protected. They felt harmed. They felt threatened. They felt intimidated. The business owners downtown, they felt intimidated. The people going to their stores, they felt intimidated. They didn't want to be downtown. That's not good for business. It's not good for our, for our um, ability to practice uh, uh, free speech, it's not good for our society. And so I think, I think it's really important that, that we recognize that and that I hope that we as a community can talk about this and, and understand that there's a real difference between impact and intention. And we need to be more focused. I hope we can all be more focused on what our impact is, not just what our intentions are. And, and I want to say another thing, actually. <laughs> you know, Corey, you said, I'm sorry, Chief, you said that, you know, you consider last night a success. And, and I think for the police department, last night was a su success. There was only one, one fender bender right in front of the, kind of the, the meat of the, of the march, if you will. And, and of course, because it, it caught somebody's attention and anyway, here and there, but I really appreciate uh, the chief's presence down there as well as uh, Officer Giffen was down there. Uh, the county bailiff was, was on site as well as Bonner County Security. So there was um, public safety present and, and there to ensure that nothing bad happened. And, um, and, and so I'm, I'm really grateful for their presence there yesterday. Um, but that that event yes it was a success for the police department because nobody got shot nothing got broken you know sure i i can understand why the police would consider that a success and i would say you know job well done for the police but for us as a community was that a success i can I've, i don't know how many people i've talked to in the last 24 hours that feel like yesterday was not a success for our community they have never felt like that in this community before why? Why was that necessary? So I consider a success that we all are able to walk freely through our community, up and down our sidewalks, go to our public parks and not feel threatened, not feel intimidated, not feel targeted. I consider that a success and for our businesses to be prosperous. And where people, customers are, feel welcome and comfortable going downtown and going out to dinner and going to a movie, going to spend some money at a store. That's a success for our community. Thank you for listening. So, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. And in the spirit of unity in our community, as well as listening to our better angels. I too went outside and hung out at night with these guys. During the day, I did see bright, brilliant kids with signs. And I saw grown men with guns, exercising both of their rights. Went during the evening, 
to go down and talk to these guys and the ones that I talked to, although your opinion and what you saw and talked to was accurate. And some, some of the ones that I talked to were there to protect what they felt was also their town. Mm -hmm. okay. I also saw a lot of out of town plates. I saw a lot of people that were not from our community. I saw a lot of people that might not have been from Sandpoint, but in the spirit of unity, I want to make sure that those who were there, well intended, listening to their better angels that did not want to see something negative happen, mm -hmm. were also there protecting. Okay. So I've been, We have a sacred relationship as stewards of an inheritance that is Sandpoint. We all came here. We all found this place. None of us made it. We're all trying to add to it. We are stewards of an inheritance. It is our responsibility to try to continue to make it better. The best thing that I've observed in the 20 years that I've been up here is that once you found this place, the reason why you found it is because you wanted to leave something. Do us all a favor and leave it behind and then come and embrace the stewardship and the inheritance that is Sandpoint. In the spirit of unity, we need to talk more. So I thank you for the time. Thank you for those words. I really appreciate that. Councilman Grove, that's... Mayor, that's I'd just like to yeah. uh, report, I talked to a youth of, uh, of high school students yesterday um, as they cruised through Sandpoint at a late hour uh, with all the people banded. Their words specifically were, I've never felt so safe in my life and I'm never leaving the city of Sandpoint. Huh. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, yep. All right. I feel this is, um, I sorry, this was brought up, so I don't think everybody came here to hear all this, but it is important. A couple things is, I believe it's, there's a lot of different perspectives going to be on this particular issue. I don't want to sit here and generalize one group or one or the other. Um, I personally do not feel there's going to be a credible threat here in Sandpoint. I played volleyball at the beach with my three kids on our bikes rode down there, rode by, saw all the people on First Avenue. Um, I'm thankful to have friends on every end of the spectrum, left wing, right wing, up wing, down wing, chicken wing. Um, and I'm thankful for all the many friends I have from all the different perspectives. And um, my kids were on our bikes. We were riding, felt safe personal perspective did not wasn't even bothered my kids weren't even bothered some lady rode up next to us singing to my kids on her bike they thought it was funny so um i think what i'm what i'm trying to say is a matter of perspective on these particular things and i think everybody has the right to feel what they feel when they see this and there's no perfect answer um i don't believe there was any ill intentions with any of the protesters or anybody carrying firearms i think part of the problem is we kind of divide them when i think there's many people who would walk on a protest or carry a firearm are actually probably on the same page in many respects um the arguments against injustice not we have the right to carry firearms or the right to protest i think both groups, if we were to sit down in a room, or not both groups, anybody, we don't want injustice. And I think that's the important thing to focus on is the injustice of what they're trying to speak out against. And um, another quick thing is, the just so everybody knows, I highly doubt any of those firearms, if maybe one, were fully automatic. So to have a fully automatic rifle or handgun in the USA, you have to get a class three tax stamp. So that means you have to file for a tax stamp with the ATF you have to probably pay minimum $15,000 to about $30,000. And then you have to go through a very intensive background check. And that's if you get approved for what is called a tax stamp. And then you get the tax stamp with your FFL dealer. Then you're able to have this fully automatic weapon. Um, you can't just go to a gun store and just buy a fully automatic weapon. So most guns there were probably semi-auto. I just want to clear up that so there's no rumors of they're all fully automatic weapons. I highly doubt anybody had their 15 to 30 to 40 to 50 to $60,000 rifle 
just on the street. So just make sure we're being honest. So, yeah, thank you, Councilman. And I, you know, I don't think it mattered to those people who, who felt, you know, intimidated or, th or threatened. I don't, I don't think whether it was fully automatic or not, I don't, you know, I think that's irrelevant. But, well, I appreciate, I, I think it's relevant. Councilman, I appreciate well. your comments, yeah. but I just don't think that's relevant. I just want to try to be honest in the conversation, fully sure. automatic. I mean, it just sounds a lot scarier than it really, really is. And the last thing we need is media scaring people more than what we might already be scared. So I'm just trying to keep it honest in that perspective. Nothing against your comment. Just, I hear that a lot, just fully automatic weapons. So just trying to help out. Does the rest of the council have anything they want to add to this discussion? What turned into a discussion? Okay, moving on. Next is the public forum portion of the meeting. Please note any written comments submitted by members of the public who requested that those comments be forwarded to city council for this evening's meeting were forwarded upon receipt and will be included as part of the permanent record. <coughs> this is a public forum portion of the meeting which gives the public the opportunity to address council regarding items listed on the consent calendar or on any topic not listed on the agenda. Clerk, has anyone uh, registered to speak during the public forum? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first would be uh, Jane Fritz. Okay, and a reminder, anyone who may have, may have come in late or is, is new, um, if you want to comment during the public forum, please uh, go talk to Melissa and she'll get you signed up. So, uh, Jane Fritz, please uh, come to the podium, thank you. And for the record, please state your name and whether or not you reside in the city, thanks. And if you can keep your comments to three minutes or less, uh, that'll make everybody happy. Yes, sir. Um, I think probably taking the mask off would help too. That's fine with me. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jane Fritz. I live um, 10547 West Pine Street, which is just on the other side of the city limits. Um, I'm here to address another issue that um, Kim spoke about briefly in his report. And I plan to stick around for the conversation about um, the Parks and Rec uh, master plan and discussion as well, and have something to say about that. But um, I spoke to um, the USDA Wildlife Services agent this afternoon, contacted me, and what Kim already told you was one of the things I was going to say, not knowing he would present. But um, probably the most important thing he said to me was it would be identical to last year's operation and um, where the adults were separated from the goslings from the juveniles that they call them um, and that is really difficult to um, see happen because geese if you know anything about them are extremely protective of their their brood and um, I brought uh, a couple copies of the DVD that we made last year. Um, Chuck Smith, who's a professional videographer here in town, uh, and myself were at City Beach during the entire two hour operation. And so I'll leave a copy for the mayor and one additional copy that hopefully the members of the city council can at least view a little bit. It's 39 minutes and it'll give you a sense of how hard and cruel, in my opinion, that this process is. Um, I just want to say, according to the Idaho Fish and Game um, Regional Director Chip Corsi, he says uh, that it is capture is very stressful on the birds. It lasted two hours last year, um, where they were in a corral, um, removed one at a time, and banded, and then thrown in horse trailers, back of horse trailers with the littlest ones put in where you would put tack. The transport and the capture is the most stressful part of the whole operation and possible injuries also result. There were no mortalities, no fatalities last year in the transport, but we don't really know what happens to the geese once they're released and they are released all at once. So I guess, in my opinion is that there is alternatives to this uh, operation and the two that I would like to see to suggest to the city council to consider 
June 25th is not very far away. You have one more city council meeting, I think, before that. And, and so it's just um, Away With Geese is a product that's used in Coeur d'Alene. It's used now at Dover Bay successfully. Um, Kim and um, I believe the mayor have both become familiar with it. So I won't get into that, obviously. But I do want to suggest, rather than using the $3,000 to pay USDA, only to have 50% of the geese return again, to employ this device that's guaranteed. And that and remove the dog ban um, on City Beach, like was done with Lakeview Park in 2011. It was a temporary ban, a temporary ordinance to allow dogs on leash, both in Lakeview and Hickory Park, but Lakeview was pretty significant. The Panhandle Animal Shelter had a poop patrol and citizens kind of patrolled the area to make sure that it was effective. Kim was very cooperative with Mandy Evans, who was leading that. Mandy is the executive director of the animal shelter. And then in 2013, it became a permanent ordinance. And that can be done without changing the entire dog ordinance that was passed in 1994. So it's been 26 years, it may be time to do that. I really personally think that if we had dogs there unpredictably acting like predators that the geese would not stay with their babies or come back and graze after mold. And so I'm glad to hear that hazing is occurring and um, the other thing that could be done is um, vegetative management, but I'll get into that during the discussion on the parks plan. So thank you. And I'll just leave this is a map that Away With Geese took our city beach and kind of designed what they would do with it with industrial um, product. And then here are Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Fritz. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, next. Perky Smith Hagedon. Perky Smith Hagedon. And again, please, for the record, if you can state whether or not you live within mm -hmm. the city. Uh, I'm a resident of Dover, Idaho, and I'm speaking on behalf of Danielle Packard. Uh, it's important for me to know, for you to know, that I'm in complete agreement with her statement. This is a written statement. For statement prepared by Danielle Packard. I am a resident of Sandpoint, educator in Sandpoint, and a mother of two small children. I'm going on record to express my urgent concern about the fear mongering and open threats of violence tearing apart our community. Last night, Sandpoint was occupied by heavily armed and aggressive people, most of whom do not live here. As a mother and a community member, I am now scared to go downtown with my children, to spend money and to enjoy our summer. At a time when we most need to come together and support our people, our businesses and institutions, we are terrified to do so because our city is occupied by heavily armed, armed unstable groups of people <laughs> intent on using the threat of violence to politicize their cause at the expense of the people who live here. I have absolute faith in our police force to deal with any possible threat of violence and these individuals undercut and demean that confidence by suggesting that the Sandpoint police cannot adequately protect our downtown from peaceful protesters and non-existent looters. As our elected officials, you represent our combined response to this terror. Please stand for the individuals and the businesses of Sandpoint by denouncing this loudly and often. Propose legislation that lets everyone know that Sandpoint can take care of itself. We neither need nor want unstable and heavily armed militias in our town. Until we as citizens, as businesses, and as government institutions consistently stand up to this madness, we will continue to be victimized by it. 
thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate those comments. Next. Ricky Liddy. Thank you, Ricky Witte, and if you can state whether or not you reside within the city and you have three minutes. I do reside within the city. Um, I don't have too much more to add. I did want to thank you, Mayor and a Chief, um, as well as the council members and my fellow concerned citizens for addressing what happened last night. That is exactly why I'm here. Uh, just from a personal note, I personally rode my bike through town, did not feel safe. It's the first time in 30 years that I did not feel safe in Sandpoint in a town where we don't lock our bikes. And I was terrified <laughs> riding it through town last night. Uh, I was not comfortable with what happened. I feel like it wasn't a representation of who we are as Sandpoint citizens. And I was a little ashamed as well. Uh, it was an armed militia <laughs> that I came face to face with. And I feel there was a huge irresponsibility on the part of a public official an elected official of the county that sort of called on this armed militia to protect our town i don't know who or what from because uh, everything else was fine <laughs> uh, and instead of going through proper channels like the police department um, in whom i have complete faith that they do their jobs properly uh, there's also the issue of public perception in Sandpoint, not just locally, especially not locally, but nationally. We get a lot of negative attention for things like this, and I feel like it's an inaccurate representation of who we are as a town, as a people, not part of our culture as far as me being raised here and concerned. Uh, and then also, like the mayor spoke to the economic vitality of our downtown businesses. I'm not walking in to a business with somebody standing in front of it with a gun. <laughs> I just, I don't feel comfortable with that. I feel like a lot of our businesses are suffering. They're just recently reopened and this is not a healthy way to try to get people back into our town as tourists, try to get people back into our businesses as patrons. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Whitty, really appreciate that. Uh, so Clark? Josh Volkman. Hello. Hello. My name is Josh Volkman. I'm a business owner in town, live in Sandpoint. Love it here. And uh, what I'm what I'm disappointed in most about the conversations that are happening tonight is it, it's more focused on on the de the demonstrators that had the rifles than what the message of the protest was. This is about systemic racism. And I think that um, I'm originally from Minneapolis. My, my, my old neighborhood's burning down right now. Um, I think that the thing we have to ask ourselves is that, you know, like Ricky brought up, people are going to be coming to town. Tourism is a major industry. I, I make recreational vehicles for people that visit town, come through town. And the first thing that they're going to see is an armed militia on the street. Doesn't matter if it's the facts behind it being an automatic or semi-automatic, I'm not concerned about that. It's me looking at that gun who has no idea about it. A time and a place, mainly. And then basically the conversation that I wanna bring up is what we're doing to try to be that voice for the nation, not have that negative impact on a, on a nationwide level where where the, the, the news outlets are going to report those individuals that were walking around with those guns, not about the message that you were protesting on the bridge. I wish I could have been there. I, I you know, I drove down, I, I saw it and I wasn't, I wasn't happy. And um, I mean, mainly tonight, I, I just wanted to remind everyone that, that the reason that all of this is happening is because of systemic racism. And, I, I look around and and we are accomplishing that right now. We're not trying to do that, but communities like ourselves have to have that conversation to see what we can do to be the better person. Saying you're not racist isn't enough. 
what what can we do as a community to to open the door to someone coming through and and show love and not hate i think that that's my my main two cents and um i i just want to bring it back to what the important message is in all of this nationwide the unrest that's happening it's not it's not about the few bad apples for the same reason that i look at at our police and i don't i don't say that all police are bad i understand that a few bad apples can 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 spoil the water um and it's the same with the riots you know there's some people that are going to take advantage of the situation but in our community and in our situation i don't think that we there's a there's a time and a place to 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 represent your your constitutional rights to bear arms and i just don't think that that was a time and place and and for the fact that the majority of the conversations tonight have been about those people when i think that the conversation should have been about what we can do as a community to be better and and do everything that we can to end uh, systemic racism and, and just be be the better be the better future that we want to provide for you know our children and our younger generation and that's who was representing that last night that was the voice was the high school kids and that's so so awesome to see but um i guess i just wanted to bring it back for full circle i don't want to give them the fr the the front page of the paper because they're not what this is about no matter how hard they try to make it about that it's you know it's about um, Floyd and the countless others that that I can't even remember. You know, I want to. I'm going to put a sign in my yard, and I, I'm running out of real estate, so I've got to pick one. And uh, that that's that's what all this is about. And I think that we all just need to remind ourselves moving forward that that that's what is important here. I'm asking all of ourselves what we can do to be better. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Bookman. That, that really means a lot to me. I appreciate those words. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, clerk? Hello, Mayor and City Council. Um, I live in Sagal, so I am not in the city. So, Councilman, and I don't know your names, but you spoke to bring a sacred stewardship of inheritance, that it's our responsibility to make this area better. And in the spirit of unity, we need to talk more about what stewardship means, because otherwise it's just an empty word. For all the beings that share this incredible land and water with us, the mayor mentioned um, intention and impact multiple times. So, let's look at that too, intention and impact, right? And what is the appropriate amount of force? Another thing that the mayor mentioned. Uh, what is the appropriate amount of force for the geese? I don't know. What was done last year was not good for the geese, and it was not good for the long-term geese issue for the park. Could we let the geese walk freely, not feeling targeted? These are words that you all used um, going about their business. I get it. We've decided no. We're, we're not going to let that happen. So can we be more humane? Because what's being proposed by this city council and the mayor is, and Kim is, is not humane. So I'm all about finding a good solution to do that. Um, literally do. I'm hoping for a success for the geese in our community. I hope that you'll consider changing the dog ordinance for the park. I don't go to the park because my dog can't go to the park. So I don't get to have fun with my kids playing volleyball or doing any of those things. So it'd be great if I, I could go and bring my dog to the park. And perhaps we could use the money that was set aside to relocate the geese and use um, the away with geese product that seems to be working from as much as the little bit that I called around in 20 minutes. Seemed like it's a pretty okay product. And I did sit through that meeting last year that seemed like a bit of waste of my time because I never got a call back about it. I never got any answers to my emails and I haven't even got the request for paper that I asked for um, two weeks ago. So I'm not really stoked about the city council and how that it's all being, or not the city council, but whoever is handling that. Um, I'm not stoked about that. So I would like uh, us to really look at what does it mean to be a good steward to this land that we've inherited, um, a good steward to live in harmony 
with the people that are carrying guns, that are not carrying guns, that are geese, that are not geese. Um, why are we just focused on whatever our agenda is and whatever our groups are? Um, I personally drove past the bridge last night and I didn't, I, I felt, um, I felt fine. I felt like I was happy, like you were saying, that the, the teenagers were able to speak their mind and use their First Amendment rights and that the people that were there holding the guns, thinking they were going to protect. Now, do I agree or not agree? It doesn't matter. It's like it's their right. And they didn't look like they were being violent. So moving to this area, I'm really noticing that you just got to have a nice blend. You got to we all got to get along um, the right and the left and the chicken wings and the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Miss Ham. Appreciate that. Uh, clerk, do we have another? Toby McNeil. Mr. McNeil. Hello, Mayor, members of the council, audience. My name is Toby McNeil, and I live in the city of Sandpoint. I didn't plan on talking about any of this, but after what was said, it, <laughs> I came to listen to what's going on with the parks and the and all that stuff. But I'll be quick. Um, I guess I'll just say that I feel a lot of this on both sides. We can understand people being uncomfortable with all this with guns and, and all these things. At the same time, I see I'm a factual based person. I'm an engineer, so I'm logical. And on both sides, I, pe I hear people saying statements that are inflammatory and not factual. Mayor, you mentioned that it was unnecessary. They had no impact, the people with guns. I could understand you saying you feel there was an unnecessary, but at the same time, I don't know that we really know that. I hardly get on social media, but I was saw on social media, for example, in Coeur d'Alene, a lot of armed people were out there and people seemed very grateful because they, you know, I saw, and I'm not saying that what I saw on social media was factual, but just the impact and feeling that I had and others I spoke with was that um, they prevented, they were out there because they'd had what they felt was credible evidence. People were coming from Spokane and were going to infiltrate. So they were protecting the community and the businesses and people felt comfortable i heard people say that they were unstable these unstable people with guns you don't know that they're unstable people get just as uncomfortable you know some of the people that are marching are unstable and i'm not promoting people go out with guns trust me you know i'm not promoting that but i'm just saying everybody on when you read statements are inflammatory and it causes more dissension than bringing us together you know um because there are frankly unstable people as you've seen in these riots that you know start burning and looting so at the same time um we don't know frankly if they had an impact or not we don't know that there wasn't people likely there wasn't the police chief said there was no at least after the fact and no credible threats but frankly i don't think anybody here can say that they know that there wasn't a plan from people to come and raid and loot businesses in bonner county probably not but i just say you know you don't know <laughs> you know they could have been helping things and they were good intent we all need to work together i understand the fear but but Frankly, most of the people with guns and by far the large majority, they're law abiding, good citizens and councilman Espiro. Yeah, it might not matter that they weren't automatic weapons, but I think it was a good statement you made. It's just another fact. When people throw things out like all these people with all these automatic weapons, again, it's inflammatory and it's, it's not bringing us together, but it's just making more decisiveness on both sides. Thank you. Thank you. Clerk? I have no other um, sign up for public forum. Okay. Is there anyone uh, participating online via Zoom that would like to raise their hand and speak at this time at the public forum? All right. And seeing none, that concludes the public forum portion of this evening's meeting. You, you, you want to do one more? Yeah, we can do one more. Sure. 
Okay. And if, uh, so please state whether or not you reside within the city, and if you can I keep do it. Do not minutes, reside okay. within the city. I resided uh, out in uh, halfway towards Hope. Okay. okay, I didn't catch your name. I'm sorry. Tom Whalen. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I I came here as just to listen, and um, I appreciate what everybody's saying. Uh, automatic versus non-automatic weapons, things like that. I own guns. I actually um, tell you right now, I'm, I'm a, I don't agree with people packing guns down to a city who aren't trained. And that's one of the things like from an engineering perspective is, yeah, you can say that, um, you know, people are there to just in their best goodwill to do the right thing. But if a window breaks, the kid is running, let's, let's make him a black kid. We don't have any. Let's say he's running down the road. What's somebody with an automatic weapon going to do? What are they going to do? How are they trained? We used to police. And by the way, I've been in law enforcement for 31 years, just retired. The police have training. These people do not, in most cases, they don't have that training. And so do you really want them to be out there making that split second decision on what they just saw? We're already seeing the repercussions of that all around the country. We're seeing bad, bad, even, even from the police, bad protocol, bad procedure. It's leading to bad decisions. And it's, it's led to a lot of violence and uh, some unfortunate things. Um, what this fellow said here was brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> um, again, I'm a gun owner. I'm not packing heat, <laughs> okay? I, I, I think there's a, a time and a place for that. Um, I don't think coming into these environments or going to, let's, let's move it to the uh, uh, music festival, for instance. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't want somebody starting a gunfight protecting me in that situation. It takes a tremendous amount of training, most of which I doubt the people that were out there and with all great intentions do not have that training. It's just like engineering. You, you need a high level of training to make those, you know, to make the right decision. And, um, you know, I would also tell you that the only experience I have, I've never been shot. I've been shot. I had a bullet by my ear. My dad was shot twice in World War II. He jumped on D-Day. Do you know the only thing he ever taught me, the only thing he ever said was don't hate. That was, that was key. You know, don't hate. And that's, that's what we're seeing. It's, it's one thing to go down and practice your, yes, it's all within our rights, right, to do that. But is it the right thing to do? Absolutely not. I think it is intimidating. And I, I do think um, you guys should stand up and, you know, make that statement. You know, just say, hey, it's good to have that, but do it somewhere else, okay? <laughs> Stay out in the woods, okay? Use your rights out there. But um, anyway, that's it. That's all I wanted to say, so. Thank you, Ray, and I really appreciate those comments. Um, yeah, and it brought several things to mind. And, you know, I appreciate this, particularly as a law enforcement officer, and, and I, you know, I agree with you entirely. Um, you know, that's why we have police, right? They, and and I, I began my statement with, with all the kinds of training that our police officers have in order to be able to handle the variety of situations um, that they come across in, in society, right? Um, and that they bring the proper level of force to the situation and handle it appropriately and not to, you know, over overkill and then spill their impact over on other citizens that are, you know, nearby or, or, you know, could potentially otherwise impacted. Um, and the difference is, is that our police officers are accountable to us. They're accountable to the city, to this elected body, to you as citizens. If they mess up, we know who they are, what they did, what they did wrong. They, if, if th there's accountability there and then there's a process by which we can improve so that maybe there was, there was something wrong with the protocol. We can improve the process so they do better next time, right? Um, vigilantes are not accountable. They are, their, their level of training, some of them may have excellent training. Some of them may be ex-police officers. Some of them may have, you know, have their first gun for six months and have, have never even thought about you know, how to handle a situation. If a situation like that happened where there was a looter or somebody throws a rock through a window and, you know, kids running down the street, 
they don't have any authority, any legal authority to shoot that kid. And I sure as hell hope they wouldn't. But how are they going to handle that situation? I, I appreciate that you brought that up. There's no legal way for them to handle that situation. Certainly not with a gun. They could, you know, re retain the person or something if, if they could. But there's, they don't have the legal, the law doesn't support them taking law into their own hands. That's what police are for. That's what we hire them for. That's what we train them for. That's what we entrust them with our confidence for. So I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Next is the consent calendar. <laughs> for the record, the total amount of bills is $681,596.99 for regular payables. Are there any items council wishes to remove from the consent calendar? No, okay. Uh, I would entertain a motion that the consent calendar be approved. I moved. Second. It's moved, moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Councilman Darley? Yes. Councilwoman Williamson? Yes. Councilman Espero? Yes. Councilwoman Rule? Yes. Councilman Grove? Yes. Councilwoman McAllister? Yes. Motion passes. Next is a revised parks site plan. Uh, it's the first item under old business this evening, and it's a presentation on our revised parks and recreation site plans. Uh, City Administrator Jennifer Stapleton and Parks and Recreation Open Spaces Director Kim Woodruff will provide a presentation for us. Thank you. Uh, we're excited to be able to share uh, part of our parks and rec uh, master plan process. Again, a quick summary, uh, we are working on both an overall parks, rec, trails, open space plan uh, overall plan and then we also drill down into some more of the site specific locations. Uh, so tonight we're going to go over the site specific locations and then schedule for next council meeting or the more general plan. Again this is a presentation, uh, questions and, and public participation uh, and we'll do the same format then in two weeks for the overall master plan and then in July I believe we'll be bringing forth the information to council approval is that um, so this is a presentation on the uh, site-specific plans. At our, your next council meeting on uh, June 17th, we will be coming back with the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, including all of the recommendations um, in that master plan. The site-specific plans that you'll see tonight will be included in the master plan as an appendix. And then ultimately, the Parks and Recreation master plan, including the site-specific plans, will come back to council at your first meeting in July for consideration for adoption. So, and the reason that we've set up this process this way and we've split up the master plan with the site specific plans is to provide adequate ample opportunity for the public to provide us feedback. So we currently have a link with the former site plans um, that is available online following the meeting tonight. Uh, we will be posting these revised master plans on that site as well where the public can provide us comment online. In addition to that, we have the master plans available and on display here in uh, City Hall as well. So we've replaced the prior master plans with these revised plans in City Hall. So if any members of the public don't have online access or that isn't their preferable um, way of communicating with us about it, they're welcome to contact um, Kim Woodruff or myself and schedule a meeting or just come into City Hall and provide us feedback on any of the plans or ask any of the questions relative to the plans. So um, I'm gonna ask Kim to uh, cover uh, the overview. Let's start with uh, City Beach. Okay, great. Uh, so I wanna, the overall for these site specific master plans, the, the the, the big takeaway is that, that these are a, a plan that we hope to go for and as we look at our park spaces and our public spaces to uh, have a vision of use and service to our citizens and visitors for the next 50 plus years. 
Uh, all these sites that we're talking about currently exist, some of them, uh, as far as the downtown, kind of, they're just recently purchased. But uh, a lot of the parks that we're going to be looking at uh, originally when put together or were more opportunistic in design. So we acquired the piece of property uh, for the beach or, or the sports complex. And as we had opportunities to, to develop a little bit here and a little bit there, we took advantage of those opportunities. So what I like to look at it is we were more opportunistic than plan driven in how we approached our park system. Uh, working with Jennifer, uh, this has been a long time dream of mine, is to come up with a master plan and, and she's been supportive of a plan development that we can go in and these different bits and pieces once we have a plan is to be able to take bits and pieces and, and create towards the plan and know where we're going, uh, be able to uh, position ourselves in the city for grants, foundation, opportunities. Uh, if someone comes in and say, hey, I would like to do something for our park system or uh, we can say, well, here's our plan. Uh, here's uh, a, an opportunity. In fact, uh, right after we started this process, we had a family approach us for a sizable donation uh, towards a, and we were able to be able to share our plans and say, here's kind of what we're thinking. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll just go ahead and jump into the beach plan. And I don't know if the public can read that very well. And if council had a, an opportunity to study, but we can maybe go ahead and start uh, on the top right, and then you really can't see the, the right. Can we get rid of the... the I'm the working on it. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So we have it where the existing Lady Liberty statue is, and then the existing beach perimeter trail and grass berm, and you can kind of follow that over. Uh, let me know if, I'm, if you're following me or not. I can't, I'm looking down and sitting up at you. Uh, the existing group shelter with improved access, so that's again the beach that we have now, and the existing restroom would stay as proposed. Uh, now we're kind of getting into some of the changes, and again the overall picture of City Beach is what we want to have this is uh, to first and foremost is serve our, our beach going public and our families. So the number one thing is to protect, and I think if you read through the narrative, is the family friendly opportunity for the beach. But if you go down to the beach and you see, and then really take a hard look at how it operates in the summer, most of the family re relaxation and passive recreation is on the perimeter and the beach. And, and the interior, what we see is some sports play, the volleyball courts are quite successful, and some tennis. But overall, uh, the interior uh, is underutilized. And so when we came up with our consultants and said, what, what can we do to, to possibly maximize this asset for the citizens? is our passive recreation beach opportunity, but also what can we use it in proximity to our downtown to drive our tourism and our resort community. And so taking that in mind, is uh, it really is quite a, 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 a reconfiguration and redesign of this whole space. And I think is really uh, one that's gonna serve us for a long time. So jumping back kind of into the, 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 those changes now, you can see overall the central part would be more open and friendly to any type of a maybe event or special activity uh, for a sitting, uh, beer fest, pig, pig out in the park type event, again in proximity to our downtown. Uh, so going back to the, the, the net narrative on the, on the map, the emergency service lane with the hammerhead access and location for portable restrooms and during events. So the infrastructure, as we look at this overall design, has things in place that we've learned that we need to do if we do have larger events. What can we do as far as planning for hardscape, uh, uh, public interaction for concessions, food, uh, performers, cooking, things like that? What kind of infrastructure do we need to support that? And so that's where you'll see some of that on the, uh, on the on some of this hardscape. Uh, the ADA accessible parking stalls, uh, again, right now and where the, uh, the current turnaround is, uh, and, and the turnaround for fire trucks with the radius requirements used as the basis of design. So uh, uh, again, pointing out that all of the design has been taking into account uh, turn radius for emergency vehicles, EMS, and the lights. Uh, going down to the hardscape and, and to the, the space event and stage, and that's kind of where you see the basketball courts. And uh, showing that what that would be would be a, a basketball court that we would be able to remove the, the standard poles and use that space for some type of a performance, uh, the performing arts, 
uh, cooking, chili fest, whatever type of things are going to be coming down the pipe that we could possibly have, not only for, for summer season, but shoulder season. And I think that that's the big thing. So look what we can do. And for the, 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 the times that I've been here, and it's been interesting to see us grow in events and we, uh, is uh, to, to target those shoulder seasons when we need to help uh, support our downtown, our eateries, our, our, our retail sales, and in the lugs. And this kind of ties in a little bit too with uh, the proposal for the property swap when we get down to that of, of, of the Edgewater property. And, uh, so let's keep, kind of keep going around the perimeter or the, the outside here. Uh, the can re reconfiguring the uh, swimming area and sunbathing area with non motorized accessible launch. And this would be a kind of a good time to segue a little bit and talk about the overall picture. Of, of, of the property trade proposed, and Jennifer can, can kind of get out a little bit as soon as I kind of do my overall stuff, is uh, to relocate uh, the, the beach and, and the, the boat access to the corner down where the RV park is now and in the property trade with the, with the Edgewater. Well, what that would do is take that entire activity and cluster and unsafe situation that we have right now with going through the park with boats, and trailers and kids and everything else in there to the boat launch and having that all kind of segued and separated from the, the beach proper. So uh, and also that the area then of the beach would, would uh, re uh, greatly increase our number of boat parking spots. Uh, we actually just this uh, week did some, some reconfiguration uh, down there for parking to make it uh, more effective but we're getting a lot more boats and, and, and as, the, as our area increases in size and popularity, we still have a finite number of boat launches. And in the city of Sampling, we don't have any other areas right now that we can look at. So I think to try to maximize what we can do uh, to accommodate the boating public, separate that from the beach event public, uh, was really quite uh, uh, something I never would have thought about. And bringing in green play and the parks planning and Bill, uh, Hatch, who was the landscape architect when he came up with this idea, uh, first of all, kind of caught me off guard as far as the, the trade and the property. And I think, you know, some people feel strongly one way or the other, but when you really look at the big takeaway on what this positions us for the voting public, the recreating public, the event public, the driver downtown for economy really puts us in, in, a, in a positive situation. Hey, Kim, quick question. Um, can you estimate uh, about how many new slips that that creates? Yeah, uh, I did it in our, in our 2020, 2012 report right now, we have about in the parking lot, 250 cars and 15 RV boat parkings. Uh, the proposed plan before you is 330 cars, 38 boat parking, and also accommodates the RV and oversized area uh, kind of where the, the buses are. So it, it takes a, increases parking on that. And, and to be quite candid though, boat slips. the, the trade-off there is when you look up on the, the polka dotted line. It's hard. There's a small amount of area that has been uh, changed from from grassy area into parking in this current configuration. Uh, however, the usable green space has been increased with the way that it's been reconfigured and redesigned. And a lot of it is even as far as simply where we put how we plant trees has been haphazard down there. You look in there and there's some trees here and there's some trees there and they got the big roots and it's really, really not a, a thought out plan. And this one has a lot more of a central area. Uh, so let's go ahead and keep going around uh, for the dock expansion uh, to, to uh, reconfigure the dock. So right now the, 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 the marina that we have for City Beach Marina, the city owns and operates two marinas, City Beach Marina, which is right there at City Beach and then the Windbag Marina, which is, is not on the discussion for tonight. But to reconfigure that marina spot and move it from where it currently is to accommodate uh, where the launch is right now, the part of the City Beach Marina that we currently have is on property of the Edgewater, of, of Sand Island. And so we have an agreement where we trade uh, that with some property in front that they lease from us, and there's a bunch of swappy stuff that's been going on. But basically, kind of in the end, of the, at the end of the day, uh, if we go through with the proposed property swap, it's just a more a permanent. Uh, solution to what we've been doing with the with the Edgewater and Sand Island properties for some time, like 40 plus years. Um, in, in the boating area, we have a boat wash station, and so to accommodate, uh, you know, to prepare for your launch, 
uh, to be able to, uh, when you pull your boat out, clean it off before you leave. Uh, there have been some issues and concerns about that. It's a shallow bay in there where we're proposing to move the boats uh, for launch. I have contacted the, the, the uh, agencies, the permitting agencies for that, the Department of uh, Idaho Department of Lands and, and Army Corps of Engineers contacted both agencies. Uh, they didn't come out and, and say, hey, yes, you can go dredge, but it's a very common thing that happens. The big thing is to make sure that we think it out so we don't have to come in and dredge every season. The big thing there is the, the turbidity and, and, and we are in a, a protected bull trout basin. And so anything you do that's below uh, uh, the high water mark of 2062.5 has worked with those agencies. Uh, so, but what I'm saying is that the, the, I'm quite confident that there's a solution to that, that, that boat launch. So that kind of takes us through the boat launch area. And then on the other side, looking on the left for everybody, uh, kind of speaks to the Edgewater property. And now this is not a true representation, and I don't know exactly what the Edgewater's plans are. Jennifer can kind of speak a little bit more to the actual proposed property uh, situation at the beach. Uh, but uh, but I don't think that, again this is just our, uh, our our conception of what it possibly could be. I'm sure that there are more specific plans uh, for, for the Edgewater, but I but I am quite confident that they do plan on still protecting uh, the, the grass and and view shed in front of the the hotel. And to be to, to be real clear, what we're looking at in trading is pretty is is the uh, the sidewalk that is in front of the Edgewater between the sand and the grass where it would be just the grass so, and, and going towards the edge water west. And so the, the path proper, the, the concrete sidewalk, and the sand side was still in city ownership. Versus the, the, the property that we're looking to acquire or trade for, actually, so there is no true waterfront, there's water view, and it's killer view, I mean, it, it, that's there is. But the waterfront proper, uh, we would actually gain on the other property. So as far as the uh, lineal feet of waterfront access acquired by the city would, would, would be great. Uh, so kind of going up and around, uh, we talked about the, the different, uh, the parking lot there, the beach and expanding to its uh, 330 cars. Uh, add the uh, turn around, still promenade, fair markets. Yeah, just again the infrastructure in there, and you can kind of see right now where that the the, the roadway is that, that we just recently opened the last couple of years and opened the parking and the concession area is to capitalize on that hardscape in there. And so if we were to have food vendors or any other type of activity where we needed hardscape to protect our turf and 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 be able to accommodate that, so it was an activity. So pretty much what it's set up here is the outside has. Fun stuff and infrastructure, the very outside, passive recreation, swimming. Uh, the inside, place to hang out, uh, enjoy different activities, play frisbee, you know, just like a, an open park. Uh, we are proposing in there to consider a splash pad uh, to expand and enlarge and make into maybe a more of our playground into a regional playground. We've been pretty aggressive the last 15 years in upgrading our playgrounds. City Beach would be the next logical one. It's a, it's a tired one and it needs some replacement. But if you go bit down to Coeur d'Alene, then you see maybe what they, they consider a, a, the regional a destination playground. It's someone that would be with, where you would travel in to have something to play with the playground. So that makes sense for that spot. And then to uh, go in and remodel the existing restrooms, concession building, and our lifeguards, with, we go, and as an aside, we have like over 20. <laughs> I talked to like three people today, and they're like, I'm going to live coach stuff. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's been good. So again, you know, we're looking at this, the overall thing, and, and what can, and will happen here is, you know, uh, and, and it is critical to this plan, is, is this property swap. And it's something that we, uh, Jennifer, I'm going to say, what do you want? I think I'm, thank you, Kim. I think I'm going to start with first on highlighting some of the differences from the previous plan that you saw and this revised plan that were made in response to discussions at council meeting and from public impact input that we received at workshops, um, at meetings here at, at the city as well as um, online uh, because our both Greenplay and um, both Greenplay and our landscape designer, Del Hatch, um, have been tracking all of those, sometimes answering questions you can see in the blog 
um, but reviewing all of the comments that we received and redesigning in response to those. One of the significant comments that we heard from the public relative to the previous plan uh, that, that was prepared was a concern about that loss of feel and look of the open green space and the views of the lake itself. Um, in response to that, what you will see in this revised plan is um, some of the parking size Parking lot size has been reduced from what was previously presented. So that's specifically in that corner there where um, there's the uh, proposed location for potential caras carousel or, or an another structure, but this, this depicts potentially the carousel being located there. Um, and then also the relocation of the event center and activity from the, the north end of, of the beach to the south end um, adjacent to the parking lot. So that was to preserve, preserve that, that water view. That was also in response to concerns we had from many members of the public relative to if there was an opportunity for a musical performance of any kind. Um, Initially, you'll recall when this was presented, it featured potentially the festival tent at the location, but the intention again was that maybe it could accommodate the festival or similar activity or it's any other type of community event. So um, moving that to the south side allowed for the preservation of the view, but in the case that it was an event that featured music, um, that the music would be going out instead of towards the railroad tracks for noise reduction. And we did have um, at least one individual in the community who's um, one of our um, well-known event organizers and a music producer came in and had a, a meeting with us about this and suggested that this location would be better for, um, for listening to music and for sound production than the north location. The benefit with moving it to this location as well is it allowed for removal of some of that hardscape again that we were seeing in that initial design and um, really in many ways in terms of if there are events that occur down there, down at City Beach, um, it allows for that accommodated parking without us having to close off portions of the grassway or have that larger kind of promenade there on the north side, you might recall um, that that was extended beyond the snack shack to kind of over where the volleyball court is. So it's hard. I'm pointing at my screen and you're looking up there. So if I'm trying to be descriptive yeah. <laughs> with, with how I'm explaining this. Um, so that was a significant change that was made with this redesign. In addition, in response. Jennifer, can I, can yeah. I add one thing to that? Another uh, benefit of moving that to the south, as it's uh, as you see it before you, is that, um, and we also heard this from our producer consultant, that um, those performers, uh, if we do have an event, um, music event, for instance, they want to get right backstage, have immediate access from their um, from their trailer, or their traveling vehicle, to the backstage area, and, and it's a protected area without having to be sort of, you know, go through a corridor, um, public corridor, to get there. So. Um, that was just one additional benefit of moving it south like that. Great. Um, in the previous version, um, the uh, sand volleyball courts were also removed. You can see those added back in. Again, um, there's been much discussion about that as an amenity down at City Beach, and they've been rather popular lately. So, How large um, is that space? Like, how many courts would that space hold? Same equal to what we had. Same as what we had. Same as what we had. Yeah. Is there really any time small. to speak on that? Because that is something that yeah. I plan on speaking so It's about. a big park. Any questions? Any, yeah. So um, I was reflecting, this is just my opinion. I was reflecting on last year, I go to the beach about three to four times a week, you know, having little kids. Uh, I'm also have been a very big basketball player in this community and um, recently volleyball. And I'll, I'll just, from my perspective from this year so far and last year, is volleyball has become very popular in this town and we actually have quite amazing volleyball players and they don't really care about the view just in my conversation with the the players um they don't really want 
the best view. They just want courts. And I can sympathize with that. Last night I was there from 4.30 to um, pretty late and it was packed. And it's becoming a lot more popular. And um, I just want to insert that as much as I like the idea, um, this is my opinion of a f music festival or things like that. You know, those people aren't here all the time. We may not even have that there, but we will have people playing volleyball there all the time. And um, it's my opinion that maybe not give the volleyball players the best view, but give them maybe more room in the middle. I know that might take away from a possible event or a festival, um, but festivals come and go here and there. We may not even have them where I can guarantee you that as town gets busier, that we will have a lot more volleyball or basketball. And I would argue as much as I love basketball, volleyball is a lot more popular in this town. And to uh, accommodate that, because that's a sport where everybody loves playing, whether you're really good or not really good. Um, so those are my two cents reflecting on last year and this year and last night, especially seeing a ton of people waiting to play on the courts. I would um, recommend adding more volleyball courts <coughs> and maybe saving the open space that view for. Um, I understand the music may not sound the same, but I'm looking toward our, you know, community in the, in the sports aspect. And that's just what I've been noticing. Mr. Mayor. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, so just an allocation to that user space as, as well as the green space is important because one of the criticisms that I hear is that we're paving over paradise for a parking lot. And I, I really like trading the, the property for being able to separate those user groups that's going to really facilitate that dynamic and I think that make the experience of that beach that much better for, for multiple groups, which is great, as well as, as allocating more space to volleyball as we can, but making sure that we have a commitment to our community that we are not, in fact, paving over paradise for parking lots and that green space. If we can really show that we are gaining green space as opposed to losing that would be helpful. And you know, so um, I really want to reach out to Jane and say, I appreciate everything that she's doing with geese. And this is a, a great opportunity for us to look at the vegetation challenges that we can have. Construction, I think is going to probably make those geese not feel very welcome there as well as, uh, as being a new council member and, and seeing that ordinances do change and they come in front of us. I would really like to, dive deep and hear what we have to say about changing since everything since we are in the process of changing then let's look at that door, dog ordinance so and those are my my comments okay. thank you very much great uh so as this is depicted um again on the last master plan it reflected uh with hard space for events that could accommodate basketball in the summertime that could be an accommodation for uh, ice skating in the wintertime uh, down at City Beach. Uh, this revised master plan contemplates a large um, band shell uh, covering part of that area so that in inclement weather in the in during the wintertime we could have hardscape space that is partially covered so it could be used specifically to have all covered space or it could be the open space outside, or it could be a combination of the two. So um, this is this contemplates a band shell, um, as similar to what we have down at Farm and Park, but on a much larger scale. So, and, and you, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, is that specifically talking about also the ice rink? Because that was the other question I have. Like the, that's a, a a lot of people are talking about. Hey, what can we do? Uh, and we keep talking about this. I don't know how that works and like how we freeze that water. Can anybody speak to the engineering on that? I, I, I can speak that the, uh, this is kind of an overall plan when we dive diving in where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, the mayor did find and share with us a, a very similar design, similar up in Canada, where was it, Mayor? Yeah, uh, Whistler. Yeah, where they had a kind of a covered area and then an open ice outside. So. Yeah. Uh, and I can speak to that it would be uh, with the snow and, and conditions to have a covered area there would be quite beneficial. Uh, but 
I, I, I would be, I understand that there's been a, for a long time a, a push for some ice to play on. And I think that that would fit. Okay. So I hear you. Thank you. Other changes in um, response to public impact input, you can see the um, increased marina space included in, in this version, which then replaces any marina space that is lost um, with, the, um, with the proposed relocation of the boat launch and, um, and parking area. Uh, you will also note that- Jennifer, Jennifer can I yes. ask, that looks like roughly double the amount of slips that we currently have on that south end. Uh, yeah, we, I don't think we've really gone through uh, on scale here. Yeah, roughly. Okay. Yep. Yep. And uh, our boat moorage is always in demand. We're always sold out. So again, being able to accommodate potentially more boat moorage is a benefit there. In addition to that, not only from the recreational aspect for uh, our citizens and our visitors, um, but boat moorage also represents one of the sources of revenue that supports our parks capital improvements. Um, and upgrades um, as we move forward with our parks. So our um, boat moorage is actually the most significant revenue generator within our park system and supports um, many of the improvements that we do throughout the park system on a year over year basis. Uh, you'll also note, I'm gonna try to get down here so you can see this a little bit better, but there was a lot of discussion about um, connectivity from the city beach side waterfront um, around to the Sand Creek Landing area on the other side. So um, this revised draft includes a uh, public um, boardwalk connection area uh, down below the boat launch, you can see. And that's connecting around the corner again to our park area and parking lot area along Sand Creek. Um, one of the other elements at, uh, at City Beach that's been contemplated in another master plan but was not included in the initial draft of this plan was a trailhead for the Ponderay Bay Trail. And you can see it's in the Ponderay Bay Trail master plan and it's contemplated as kind of a landing area and signage for the trail. It's right there um, at the corner of the um, driveway entrance to City Beach and that pathway in front of the uh, hotel and uh, the waterfront there. So um, this pulled out that concept from the Ponderay Bay Trail master plan and incorporated it into uh, then the city beach master plan. Um, other changes included some improvements in terms of ingress and egress from a traffic standpoint into both the city beach parking lot area as well as to the boat launch area. There were concerns um, about how that kind of functioned both from the general public but also um, from uh, Chief Kuhn and also Amanda Wilson in our infrastructure division with concerns on turning movements and just access, particularly for trailers. So there are some changes that were made into that parking lot area. Um, finally, I, I would note, um, as, as Kim has referenced, this master plan contemplates um, the acquisition of additional property to accomplish the move of the boat launch and reduce the conflict that we have between um, boat launching activity, walkway activity, family recreation activity. And um, for anyone that's been in our boat launch and tried to launch a boat at our current location, um, frankly, we have a we have what could be deemed to be a dangerous situation. We've got people coming back and forth on bikes, people walking with kids. We have the conflict of that boat launch area with that in-person or that um, non-motorized watercraft occurring in the same area. So this contemplates again, the movement of the, the boat launch to separate it from that pedestrian and recreational activity that we see in other parts of the beach. Uh, and it also uh, contemplates removing that trailer 
parking related to that boat and trailer parking related to the boat launch and removing that from the uh, general parking area, which provides additional uh, parking both for car parks as well as for uh, boat and trailer parking and also reduces the conflict that we deal with at City Beach on a daily basis where we've got cars parking and boat and trailer parking and so taking away that recreational amenity and then vice versa and then we've got the two conflicting with one another with the ingress and egress from the parking lot. Uh, in order to um, accomplish this and the acquisition of the property, we had had a discussion with the Cox family about what it might take and if there was an interest um, from them to sell the property to do a permanent or a permanent trade. It was there some way to accomplish this um, as proposed in the master plan. Um, at the, they have been working on a uh, redesign for uh, the hotel and we expect that to be coming forward, may likely trigger a conditional use permit process. So we likely will be seeing it go through planning and zoning commission and ultimately up to, to council, but we haven't seen the application for that yet. Uh, the interest from the Cox family um, relative to their project was the need to gain some additional space to push out the hotel to accommodate a larger number of guests, as well as to have space to expand and really build upon um, the restaurant um, down at the location. So the intention is to rebuild the hotel. They are still planning on a teardown this year, but it's also to their designs include accommodating Trinity down at the location and retaining Trinity down at the beach. Uh, we have been in a long-term lease um, back and forth in a, in a trade between the Cox family and the city with these two properties. Um, but for a long period of time, for the city, we currently have our boat moorage there where this boat launch is, um, is proposed along Sand Creek. And we don't have a permanent guarantee that that boat moorage is available to our for our use nor that waterfront. And so accomplishing the acquisition of the, of the property would accomplish this vision as proposed, which includes really additional waterfront for the public in perpetuity. Um, as proposed, and this will be coming forward to council um, as a public hearing item, would be a land swap to accomplish the acquisition of this property. And that land swap would include, as Kim referenced, the grassy area in front of the hotel and what's reflected on this diagram is the hotel with its existing layout. So it's the grassy area from the hotel uh, to the uh, walkway in front of the hotel. And then you can see the pathway and we've got an ADA accessible pathway on the west side of the hotel towards Dock Street and where Windbag Marina is. We've got a strip of grass that um, is between that pathway and Dock Street. That would not be part of the trade. It would be only the property here that is between the, again, our pathways, kind of framing the pathways. And on the other side of that trailhead for the Ponderay Bay Trail and the hotel in exchange for a straight across transfer of that property um, where the boat launch is proposed. We will be uh, setting a public hearing for this. This would have to go through a surplus and disposition process through the council. So there is an opportunity for the public to have input into this and for us to provide the full information about what this would look like. So we're not asking council to approve this tonight. Um, this again is just a presentation of this plan and the opportunity for for public input, but again, this plan anticipates um, a property swap. A question might be why the swap uh, as opposed to an outright purchase of that property. We did have that conversation with the, the Cox family and um, we will have appraisals as part of the notice of public hearing. 
Um, that property, we have had an appraisal done on that property proposed for the boat launch. It's valued at in, in excess of $2 million. So um, it was looking at how this vision could be accomplished um, to achieve the benefit to the public and a way for the city to acquire that boat launch property as proposed here in perpetuity for the public without having to upfront the cash to purchase the property. Uh, so that will be coming before council. We'll be scheduling that public hearing and we'll be uh, notice, noticing the, the data on that in the near future. And we will make sure that the public is fully aware of, of when that date is. There has been some questions relative to restrictions on the property. So this property was initially gifted to the city by um, the railroad and there are restrictions on the, the properties down here at City Beach, in particular, the portion of the property that's owned by the city, um, not the Cox family property. So they do not have restrictions on the property currently where the RV park is, where the boat launch would be proposed. But um, over in that area in front of the hotel, we do have restrictions where that property cannot be used for commercial purposes. We've been also doing our due diligence and having discussions with the railroad about the possibility of release of those restrictions on that property in front of the hotel, um, which would be the only thing that would make it desirable then for um, the Cox family for purposes of a swap. The railroad has indicated, we haven't gotten their formal final response on this, but they have indicated in our discussions to date, a willingness to release that restriction. They've released restrictions for us in other elements of the city beach property. And instead releasing that restriction on the property in front of the hotel and in return replacing it on the boat launch portion of the property. So um, we have been working on our due diligence on that regard. There has also been some question uh, relative that, to that boat launch and public concern about um, whether that launch at the proposed location would be deep enough um, for the launching of boats. And um, Kim uh, has been working through conversations about the process and approval with getting dredging permit in order to ensure that's a deep enough boat launch. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Any questions on uh, this design? And again, um, we this we'll start with this one, and um, these will be posted for public comment online, so everyone would be able to see what those comments are. And again, the notion that before this comes back to council for final adoption in July, that the public has an opportunity to provide input and council to consider that. One thing I might add is that going through the process of our master planning, it was very important to people to have a, a dining experience on the water at the City Beach area. And that is, was a con very consistent uh, uh, de uh, desire and supported by a lot of public input. Uh, the the property trade would facilitate that. Without the property trade, it's been communicated to us that that probably would not fit within the existing footprint of the sand island. Would we have a clarification on uh, the uses, the restrictions and all that by this meeting? Okay. Yes. By the yes. July meeting? Yes. Yes, I believe so. It's really a game changer. It is. I mean, from our engagement and all the people that have been in the forest that have, that have put time into this, it's something that can be a sustainable, maximizing the use of this property for the next year. It's super exciting for me. For what a legacy. I'm glad to hear that the hotel wants to work with Trinity. I think that's great and to their benefit. And Justin's here tonight. So Mr. Mayor, um, this we had hoped to design this as a public workshop tonight, which council and the public will be familiar with. We're kind of all sitting and having a debate about this, but with our social distancing guidelines and people being online and our limited capacity in here. Um, we changed the structure of this tonight to a presentation to council, but Mr. Mayor, if you wanna open up 
public comment yeah, on this yeah, design be before we move to others. Okay, I do have one quick question. Kim, uh, there's a little building that um, isn't labeled and I actually am just noticing it now. It's between the south end of the boat launch parking lot and the park, the car parking lot. Oh, you know, that's that that yeah. a restaurant. Oh, it is, okay. And, and it was brought, I think, by Amanda got that one for us. Is to be having a restroom in proximity to the boat launch. Okay, yeah. So that way you wouldn't have to boogie all the way down. That's smart. Yeah, like it. Basically. Yeah, really. A genius. Brilliant. Many of us have been strong advocates about permanent rest restrooms as opposed to honey buckets, I just have yeah. to say. So that yeah, contemplates yeah, yeah. a permanent <laughs> restroom. <laughs> all right. I have uh, a couple of comments. Yeah, sure. Um, so these are all sort of, there's no specific order. They're very different and just hearing from um, other people. So the, the boardwalk piece um, that is um, next to the boat launch, um, that seems somewhat counterintuitive to put a boardwalk there right in front of where people are going to be backing boats and trailers and whatnot and then um, refer to it as a connection from the city beach that is safer to get to the Sand Creek path than using the current sidewalk and walking under the railroad bridges and such. I, I in theory, you know, like the idea of there being a boardwalk there, but to say that that's safer and to direct people to walk in front of backing trailers, scary idea. I spend a lot of time down there at Memorial and that's quite fascinating at times. Um, and then, um, the promenade that was made smaller that's behind the Shake Shack, is that correct? That was decreased yes, in size? Yes, correct. The, okay. Yes. Um, again, I was kind of wondering what the use was because we moved the art festival from there, but this would be kind of for a pig out in the park type of event or something you're saying, well, Kim? I, I think it is any, any type of activity this would be more friendly to have infrastructure for that as we look into the future. Right. And because okay. of our proximity to downtown, how can we not just use this as a as a passive fun family park? How can we take that, maintain that first and foremost, and add as an asset? Well, it also was mentioned to me, um, and I don't remember who, a lot of these comments I've just kind of written down over time, um, that the potential for some farmer's market stuff to go there. I know to some degree there's a conflict because the beach can get busy, but on the other hand, if we're having a significant amount increase in parking. Um, it, Again, and then you could kind of look at that event area, that covered area with the basketball court-ish area, mm -hmm. as far as uh, the, the, the structure. I think that makes a lot of sense. Farmers market is usually early in the morning until noonish, and we start picking up about 11. -ish. So a lot I don't of things know. that can coexist in this space. So this is more of a, an event, public space slash existing family fun passive park. Okay, and then. Um, even though I just mentioned the parking, um, I'd like to point out that the car versus um, all the boat trailer stuff, if we're now taking that area and making room for uh, a lot more trailer parking and, and, and um, boats and such than we currently have, it seems like the need to truly expand the existing parking spaces that we have is still gonna be further reduced because there really is only one time and it's a very short season to put all that pavement in there. So I would like that thought process to occur too, because we're taking all of those boats and trailers out of there and freeing up a lot of parking. So um, it, it seems like there's going to be some times during the year when that's, that's a lot of pavement to look I, at. I agree. Uh, but for example, today uh, down at the beach, uh, probably of the center row of parking, two thirds of it was full of boat trailers. Not even a weekend. It's not really technically summer yet. So it's just the the, the, the boat demand. To your point, is is, is huge. And, and and you are correct though. It's just that that peak season, July August, that parking lot's going to be cramped. 
Right. And so I guess maybe I'm not being clear in that now we've made a separate parking area that we've never had for boats and trailers. Will that not allow us a lot more parking without increasing that parking that normally would have been taken up? So anyway, just a thought down there. Um, then to speak to what Joel and um, Andy both said about um, volleyball, um, I because we are making this a long-term plan, I think that it makes sense to think about the potential expansion of those courts um, and to get back to that um, sort of interconnecting that whole piece. Um, if we are having smaller music events or chili fests or whatever that is, um, I have a little bit of trouble um, stealing away the basketball courts to do an event because that takes a portion of our public, which I think is our youth who may be down enjoying the beach and doing their basketball thing, but now they can't do their basketball thing because an event's going on. So if there was an opportunity to maybe, um, you know, if that's an evening event, rethink a portion of the parking lot where we could put in temporary courts if we were having other events so that those individuals who like to do that, if we're thinking ahead there. Um, and then um, I've also heard from member of the public that they would prefer the, the beach to be a quieter environment. And so they, I know a lot of people are for the carousel, but then I've heard some other comments about um, putting the carousel um, into the Sand Creek area because they feel like in the um, shoulder seasons especially that that could bring more vitality to the downtown and it would also be a more protected area for the Keller cell to exist because the city beach can be rather freezing in the winter time um, unless you're playing hockey and sweating and so I think that um, there's there's that piece of leaving that out there. Um, uh, and then somebody mentioned that in Coeur d'Alene, they also have a carousel and it, it is, it's attached to some degree to their beach area, but it's still rather removed um, from it. But it seems to function really well in that it is in very close proximity to the park and such too. So somebody pointed that out to me. Um, and then um, to just point out, Lake Louise is also another great place for an outdoor skating arena that is not fancy. It simply has a um, an I-beam metal structure that just covers that, but it's all completely open air except for a small building. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to self-contain over in the Methow Valley and they have an amazing rink out there that is not covered but was recently updated with a building um, and um, and then just back to that last piece about the volleyball courts um, if there wasn't maybe this area where the carousel is would be another area to expand volleyball courts or something like that too so I think those were. I see a little bit to the volleyball courts because it's kind of been brought up here. You'll it looks like there's plenty of space over there to expand. Well, yeah, and then there's the proposed hills there you can see there. It is mm -hmm. it's, it's a social place. There's a lot of people that are hanging out, and, and it's not just play, it's also people hanging out and, and watching and, and participating. Uh, that's quite a large area. In all honesty, I never even thought about the view shed there for the player. If I was looking at a place where we could kind of remove they, them. They just said, hey, that's cool, but give the nice view to people with barbecuing and stuff. Don't give it to us. Just give us more courts. And I think, again, that spot there with the hills, and that was kind of looking to kind of, because it is such a, an important thing, we kind of tried to have an area for that in the design. So yeah. I, can, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. I do. Yeah. And that is quite a large area would leave us, I, I believe, adequate for expansion. Right. And uh, yeah, I never thought about Yeah, and, and to Dan, I think the, the youth, you know, mental health is nice. I'd rather see kids going out, playing sports and playing volleyball, having fun than doing other things, you know, so. But appreciate all the hard work. This is yeah. a lot. Yep. And, and I guess my final comment would be, um, just relative to as we do expand and we do grow and if we need more of these grassy areas or we need more courts, it seems that um, that use of um, space more where we're saying we might have a secondary concession or something and we already have the public concession that that 
could coexist in the Sand Creek plan, whereas a playing court, I don't think, would really function in that same location because you'd be losing your balls down the bank into wherever or putting volleyballs into people's boats as they're driving by. And it might be a new sport, but um, probably not appreciated. <laughs> so. Thank you for those comments. Anyone else? Um, Justin, would you like to speak on behalf of Trinity about this, your perspectives on this plan? We'd sure love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. My name is Justin Dick. I reside at 58 uh, Bridge Street as my restaurant. Uh, I have another restaurant on 2nd Street and I live within Sandpoint on 602 South Ella. I've been, uh, I'm going on my 11th year right now at Trinity. Uh, it's been quite the tumultuous last 21 months that we started working on this project. And by we, I mean the Cox family uh, and myself. It's been a roller coaster ride in terms of uh, where are we going to be there, where are we not going to be there. Uh, I've had incredible support from uh, Kim Woodruff and Jennifer Stapleton, as well as the Cox family moving forward with, with this to try to figure out some resolution that would allow the restaurant to stay there um and figure out what we could do with that piece of grass on the east side of the restaurant that is owned by the city and the rv park uh, that is owned just south by the cox family uh, it's been an incredible opportunity i have been in front of this council now many times over the course of the last decade um, we are we have heard time and time again i was i was included in the last master plan 10 years ago and i'm included in this master plan as well in terms of participation um, trying to figure out a way that we can build some private public partnerships in this community uh, and move those forward. I think Jeremy Grimm, Aaron Qualls, Planning and Zoning, this council and many councils before you uh, have tried to work on a plan on where we could work with more public private partnerships. Um, for just myself as a lessee of this property to be able to work with the owner of the property in terms of trying to figure out a solution on how to keep the restaurant there. Uh, you all have heard from the community. They wanted a dining experience, much more specifically with that dining experience. The Trinity was the dining experience that they wanted at that location. We have been stewards of the community time and time again. We hold many nonprofit uh, fundraisers down there, the Pondre Bay Trail Run, the Chafe 150, Spokane, the Sandpoint Relay, the Scenic Half, and many, many more. Um, all of which I think we've shown time and time again, we've been able to control the volume of people. Uh, to go back to council person rules point in terms of traffic flow down there and parking, uh, we have brought buses down there and had groups of people like the Spokane uh, to Sandpoint Relay, which brings in roughly 1,200 people into the community that are not here from the community. Uh, having them park in our public parking lots and coming down in vans uh, every 10 to 15 minutes to pick up uh, several of their relay members without taking up parking down at the beach. Uh, I think I can confidently say I've spent more time at City Beach than anyone in this community in the last decade. And I've watched that parking lot. I've watched the trucks and the trailers monopolize that parking lot over there during the summertime. And we have not yet given our town an excuse to come down there and park during the winter time. That is the city's largest asset right next to our geographical asset, um, uh, asset of that lake right down there. There's, this provides huge opportunity for some of my events uh, that I've been hosting, like the Chafe 150, to move over to that grassy area and allow many different vendors besides Trinity to get involved and to sell their products and be down there much more like a festival type when you see the festival food row, uh, where Trinity wouldn't take in all that business. but. Uh, as with change, change is challenging. Obviously, it'd be challenging for us to lose those events to go over there. Um, but I think we need to grow those events. Those events are huge for our community. Many years ago, we had the Ride Idaho group uh, that was able to camp out in the parking lot and got a one day conditional permit, I believe, to spend the night over there. There's roughly 300 riders with support staff that stayed in the grassy area overnight. Uh, it was a tough decision. Uh, the, the Downtown Sandpoint Business Association was in it, the Chamber was in it, the Council was in it, the City was in it. Uh, it generated roughly $186 uh, 
in a 24 hour period and letting those folks camp down there and start their start and stop their event down there. Uh, we have many more events that are growing quickly. Uh, 2021, we've lost most of those events right now due to the COVID pandemic. Um, this park is beautiful. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to this community. Um, to further this realignment of the properties will not only be good for this town, uh, it'll be good for everyone in this town to have a reason to go back out to City Beach, to come down in the winter. I love Schweitzer Mountain, but it takes a lot of our people outside of our downtown core and up on the mountain. And as the byway came through and I was a proponent of the byway, one of the unintended consequences of the byway coming through town is when you come off of Schweitzer Mountain, you hit you either you see it all day long. They go into the Starbucks parking lot, get their Starbucks, and they head out south on 95 and they skip our town as they come back through. And sometimes they never even hit the town when they get here as well, too. This redesign, this realignment, um, and potentially I love the idea of having the carousel of smiles as well. I've been working with that group for many years now. Uh, they've been great supporters. We are supporters of them as well, too. I would love to see them down at the beach. I think it would be a wonderful asset to the beach that we have. Um, I am always open for questions. Uh, if anybody would like to know anything, we've had great communication with the Cox family. The grass on the east side, as my understanding, will remain grass on the east side. We can let the Cox family talk about that as well. And when we talk about, if anybody's familiar with the restaurant, you know where our lounge deck is. Our uncovered lounge deck jet, jets out from our covered patio there about another 20 to 30 feet. And that would be the proposed width of that building that would encroach out onto that grass. So I ask city council to please take a long, hard look at this. And I would love to be back here at the next vote or the public information session. Thank you. Uh, wait, uh, real quick, Justin, I got a couple questions for you. Uh, do you anticipate the amount of seating, both indoor and outdoor for your restaurant to be roughly the same? Roughly the same, potentially 25 to 50 more seats. Uh, they've, they've laid down the preliminary building plans, but they're very rudimentary at this time, and we're still trying to work on where the synergies between the two businesses are. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public? that would like, Okay, please come forward. Um, go ahead, Jane. You can go first. Um, I just, uh, it's all very interesting in the redesign I just had a couple comments after listening to people talk. Um, one thing, and maybe it's because of my age and being an audio producer, but noise is something that I'm becoming increasingly aware of in Sandpoint, um, noise pollution. And I, I, in looking at this, and I appreciated uh, Councilman Hoel's uh, comments about the volleyball court, because my experience just going down, riding my bike or walking, which I do quite a bit down at City Beach because I live close to town, um, is that it's very noisy with volleyball players <laughs> as well as basketball players. And you've got that volleyball court right next to the pavilion. It's kind of surprising to me that the pavilion hasn't been expanded because every event I've ever participated in down at the pavilion is so small that there is more people having to bring tables and chairs outside of the pavilion to accommodate. And with the volleyball court there, oh my gosh, you know, I, I just can't even imagine what the noise would be like. And again, I agree that green space People go down to City Beach, from my experience, and having lived here over 40 years, is that, and half of that time in Sandpoint, is that, you know, people go down to be on the beach or to be on the grass, picnicking, hanging out, and quiet is a really important part of that. Um, you look at a, a city park like Coeur d'Alene down on their beach, they have huge trees which help you know, diminish the noise where, uh, I don't know if you're gonna move trees, cut trees down. It looks like they're in different places than the photograph I have of the way they look presently. I don't know, Kim, but um, I just think more green space is really important. And that volleyball court, because of noise, 
would be in a better place. I'm not big on the carousel, but I don't have children. Um, also, the, um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, you know, for an event center, just one question about that. Um, the trains are so noisy down there and we're gonna about maybe have another track as well. So I don't know if anybody's thought about the noise and the constant interruption. I mean, if you go walking down there, sometimes even on the Ponderay Bay Trails, one train right after another. And, you know, I know it's an issue sometimes at the festival and the train's not anywhere near where the concert stages are. So that was a question I wanted to bring up. Um, so trains and you know, the volleyball court near the pavilion where there's a lot of public activity and people picnicking and stuff. I just think the noise needs to be considered and it doesn't look like that's been even thought about maybe, I don't know. Um, and then of course, I question, you know, um, because I was here for the first part about the geese, just where geese are, where wildlife is accommodated. And, I hope it will be. Um, I'm going to just leave these pictures of, of a couple of educational signs. And like this is at Dover Bay, if you've ever walked down there, which I go there quite often as well because it's quiet and it's beautiful. And, and they have educational signs about the geese. They, you know, accommodate them and tolerate them and welcome them. Um, this is an educational sign about in Nelson, BC, their park, I think, and Nelson's Lake Park with Beach is one of the most beautiful parks I've ever been to. Um, because they have sports fields, they have it all, and they have a lot of vegetation, a lot of art. You know, that's another thing to maybe consider is public art. Down at City Beach, I don't see anything or hear anything about that. But anyway, these are a couple of signs. And then I just had, you know, as far as if geese are accommodated, which I hope they are to some degree, um, I understand the, the desire to have them away from the beach, but they, we live on a huge ecosystem. As the author of the book on Lake Pondere, I have a really good sense about how many geese are out there. And um, it, there's just some sample signs this is from the Riverstone Lake um, at, in Coeur d'Alene, um, making sure people don't feed the birds that may be there, whether they're seagulls or Canada geese. Um, and then if we're lucky enough to have the dog ban removed at City Beach, which I really strongly encourage you to look at, having signs right by the sidewalk, you know, pathway only, no dogs off leash. So people really, uh, I mean, this is their sports fields and they allow dogs. And Traverse Park is gonna be another park to look at, I'm sure. Um, anyway, so I will leave those things, but I just hope the more green space and attention to noise will be uh, considered because I don't know, in the last two months with COVID-19, I've been down there a lot there's a lot of older people as well. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of families just in the last two months. So it's a lot of older people walking or just people walking or biking and so on. So I do think it's a hugely multi-use kind of place. And, and I, I like Councilman Rule's comments about maybe there's more parking there than we really need once the boat launch and I'm glad Trinity's staying. Um, all of that's exciting. And because it's quite different than the map with that the away with geese people designed, I mean, it looks very different from the present view. <laughs> um, I was just kind of curious about a timeline on all of this besides the public hearings. Jennifer, can you address that at all? Like when would things, would they be in phases? Would they be completed by a certain date or what? We have not gotten that far into what implementation looks like. I do want to 
anticipate that it would occur in phases. Um, really, phase one to moving forward with anything like this, as we've discussed in the class in the past, is the um, adoption of a plan, um, which gives us the vision to move forward with getting all of the costs associated with it um, and looking at how we can leverage funds in starting to build out what a phase one. The, the just last comment, um, some of you know, some of you may not know, but for the last 30 years I've worked with the, the Indian tribes of the region and the Kalispell tribe of Indians, this place was a, his, was a village site. It wasn't just a camp spot, it was a village site for the Kalispell for thousands of years called Kwakwape, which means place of sand. And um, it would be nice to have some kind of interpretive information. Um, and I could even help with that since I've done uh, interpretive signs for the Kalispell tribe over the last five years. Um, in fact, we have really interesting seasonal signs. And so Sand Creek was important, the land along Sand Creek, but Kwakwape is really important to elders. And I know Jennifer was on our boat tour. I think, yeah, the mayor was not, but um, so anyway, I would just hope that some accommodation to the first peoples here would be um, made. And again, as, an, as somebody who believes in communication and education and tying them very closely, it's been my life's career whether it's in print or radio, um, educating people uh, is really important to whatever happens here. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Appreciate those comments. And we'll take you up on that offer for some, um, some guidance on, on that historical um, story and, and uh, context data. Great. So already illustrated drawings. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Mr. Hutchins? Uh, Clay Hutchison, and I do live in Sandpoint. A uh, couple of overall all comments. In uh, 2016, when this process was formally launched, uh, it started way before that. As Kim said, he's been dreaming of this for decades. One of the state of objectives was to, for this gem of Sandpoint, to develop it year round. Not develop it, but to get its access and its use year round because it primarily was just the summer, summertime. And I think a lot of the, if, uh, a lot of the feedback from the, from the process uh, was, that was very supported by, by the community. And many of the ideas on this, in this 50,000 foot plan is really to set the stage so that happens. It's not gonna happen just by the city doing it. That is, uh, you know, to get year round use, you have to have uh, synergy, you've gotta have the community um, doing events. Justin talked about a lot of kind of events and a lot of kind of kind of stuff. So this plan sets the stage for that. But I want to draw uh, 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 attention to something Kim led this presentation with. He said, and I'm not going to paraphrase him anywhere close, but essentially that the primary use of the beach is the summer recreational activities, is a recreational park. And he has stated numerous times he is not going to let that get obscured by all the other things that could happen here. So you can have events and you don't, and those events do not have to impact the primary functions and uses that people know and love and think of the beach, which tends to be the summertime beach use that's been preserved. It's gotta be preserved by whatever gets presented that we know. And then the land swap is just a brilliant thing. And, and the people that have been working on this need to be highly committed. This, this, this had a, a, almost a zero chance of coming together from people that looked at this stuff, but, but through the perseverance it has. And it's probably one of the single biggest things that will improve that park. Whether the boat launch is able to be moved because of the water issues there is, is not even relevant to that. That land swap still needs to happen because it basically unifies and realigns the use of this beach, of this, of this park, into ways that make sense. That lawn that's in front of the hotel has always been considered as part of the hotel. People really don't use that lawn, but they're keeping the beach and the walkway. And, and to be able to expand that parking down there, whether you get the boat out of there is, is boat parking out of there is just a, a, a brilliant move. And because if that didn't happen, 
and that lease goes away, we'll lose the waterfront access on that riverside and we'll end up having to maintain that grass area that is the front line of the hotel and we'll be paying for that if this land swap, that's one of the implications of this land swap doesn't happen. But that's kind of on, on the negative side, it doesn't happen, but the positive side of this thing happening, you know, assuming all those pieces fall together is, is really, uh, really masterful to put that together. But there's a lot that can happen down here that can improve the, the, the year round use. It's not going to, uh, you know, we're not gonna, you know, none of those ideas are gonna detract from the primary use, which is the, the beautiful recreation we have there in the summertime. And with respect to the carousel, real quick, uh, the phrase that's on there is potential carousel location, because we're not for profit. So what we envision is creating really a, a, a private public partnership with the city. And what that is going to involve is fairly soon coming in asking your all's permission to formally talk to all the departments that we need to, the administrators, the police, the lawyers, the parks department, to actually take up their time to come up with a really comprehensive, well thought out plan for this that could then be presented to, 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 the, uh, you know, to you all, as well as in that process of having a lot of public input and to be able to inform the public on what it really needs to have a carousel. The fact that it's in a building, for instance, so the noise, uh, the noise, carousel music, which the people consider noises contained and things like that. So, you know, just, just looking at that on there, the potential is, is an important word uh, on that for the consideration of this plan because all that is saying is, is we want the ability to, to go forward with a meaningful plan to, to bring that to your, to your attention. Thank you. And, Thank and you, really Mr. kudos Richards. to these guys that have been working on this plan. I've been involved in land planning both internationally and in the States. I know what goes into it. This is a well thought out plan that's manageable, it's to scales, to size, and it's very doable in this town. It, and it's, it's really a brilliant plan. Thank you. Mr. Hutchinson, appreciate those comments. Thank you. All right, anyone else in the public that would like to, yeah, please come forward. And thank you, Mayor, Council, and huge kudos to all the involved, Kim, Woodruff, Jennifer Stapleton, and everybody else that's been involved. Uh, these are efforts, a lot of work. And Kim made a great comment, you know, in the past, it sounds like just good history lesson somewhat, kind of taking advantage of opportunities that they've come, and now this chance to really take a look from a big picture of what really fits the community best, and all the input you guys have taken is great. And Justin, all the work you guys have done, and everybody else. So thank you. just kudos to that. Um, just a couple comments I'd have. One is that um, the uh, I guess I would strongly encourage, and I don't know if I use the exact words, but before this is approved or um, finalized or land swap, it seems to me like this issue of dredging really needs to be known and nailed down before you put too much into this and finally going with it. And not only that, are you gonna be able to dredge? Cause if you can't, that really changes this whole thing. Um, so I think that is a big thing that I just encourage you have some very, if not definite, extremely strong in evidence that you can do that. And as well as somebody that's always cost conscious, kind of consider the cost of all that and just make sure that it's incorporated into all this and the city budget and the taxes we all pay and everything else. So I don't want it to be a downside of all this necessarily, but I just encourage you to look, you know, have that nailed down up front. Um, another just a general comment is, um, it's probably in there, but other than all the things that have been brought up, a lot of uses of the beach area now, I was just down there even this last weekend and every barbecue pit and I think all the one picnic table down there was being used um, on the green areas. So just things that, that uh, and even the ones that weren't along the beach, uh, there was one picnic table right by the parking, well actually two of them, the parking space that weren't used, but every other one was used and every uh, barbecue pit that I saw was used. We walked around the whole thing. So those seem to be just popular items to use it. And last thing I'd say is that, um, I didn't really catch everything on the playground and I can't see, I think all that stuff's a big playground. I, it sounded like maybe there's going to be a big, on a really fancy playground. I don't know that that's so important at city beach, my own opinion, you know, there's having areas for 
I don't know, cornhole tournaments or open space and, <clears throat> or, you know, some playground is good, but who knows, maybe save that money for another park. Uh, just food for thought. I just don't know. And with all the opportunities, if you're thinking of having big events and all those things, there's a lot of value of open space. And I don't know, if, you know, there's so many outdoor, you know, things without just a playground. You know, just, I don't have a strong opinion either way, but I just mentioned that. But thanks again for everybody. Thank you, Mr. McNeil, for those comments. Appreciate it. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, do you want to move on to the next site? Sure, Mr. Mayor, I make a couple of just last comments sure. on this before we, we move on. We move on to the the next plan. Um, I again want to reemphasize um, the value of public-private partnerships and in our survey with the general public about how do we move forward and pay for improvements to our park system. Actually, the number one priority that we heard from the public was public-private partnerships, which again kind of led us to this notion of how to accomplish um, uh, acquiring that, that property area for the boat launch and that waterfront in perpetuity for the citizens of Sandpoint through a public-private partnership like a, a land swap, so that was contemplated here. Um, second, um, relative to Jane's comments about um, uh, recognition of the history of, of this location and and education and and potentially um, visual and and cultural displays around that um, we were not prepared to make a full announcement to council tonight but uh, and the public but as you're aware we we have uh, included in this year's budget and as an activity this year moving forward with an arts and culture and historic preservation plan um, we've gotten proposals, a number of really good proposals in. We've had a selection committee and we're actually just going through the process of final due diligence with um, one of the proposers and plan to make an announcement at the next council meeting about moving forward with the arts and culture historic preservation master plans. Um, some of that discussion included relative to this um, note of uh, cultural history and, and preservation at City Beach and other areas. So this plan did not really get into um, uh, arts and presentation of arts and cultural representations, particularly at this site, but we expect that to move forward in the Arts and Culture Historic Preservation Master Plans. Um, so I, I would just add that. Uh, I guess as a final note to, to the discussion on this. And again, there will be opportunities for public input on this moving forward as we uh, post this online. All right, let's do downtown waterfront. And I think I'll take the lead um, on downtown waterfront and hand the sports complex to, uh, to, to Kim. Um, downtown waterfront, we don't see a lot of significant changes from what you've seen in in prior versions although there is one very notable change um, that that i want to point out with this um, we have contemplated a um, improvements along um, what we call farman's landing gunnings alley um, there along the waterfront behind our buildings that are on first street um, and a, uh, again, a reminder about the acquisition of that property. The city's acquisition of the farm and landing property was primarily around stormwater uh, treatment. That is one of our primary runoff areas from really our entire downtown area into Sand Creek and ultimately into the lake. So that property was acquired predominantly um, for the purpose of stormwater treatment and management um, and it was included in this plan um, as an opportunity to look at both an area to promote economic development and recreation what you will see uh, what you see in this plan is um, and i'm actually going to stand up with me because my laptop is dead Hopefully you can hear me okay. What you see in this version, which is a substantial change from what you've seen in the, the past, is a potential building footprint 
for a property that is being contemplated by a private developer there at the burned out area of First and uh, First and Bridge. Uh, he is is looking at a development, would like to get it underway this year. Um, approximate value of, of that property is in excess of $16 million development. It includes both residential uh, living area in the downtown core on, on upper levels, as well as office area, and it does contemplate, and we've had many questions, much like Trinity is loved, so is the hound. And we get calls here at the, at the city regularly about when is the hound returning, where is the hound? Uh, so this is a developer that is looking at bringing the hound back with that development. We have had an interest at the city for a long time in trying to acquire more public right of way along Bridge Street to get better alignment of the sidewalk. And we had a ultimate goal of even if we could expand uh, Bridge Street, um, that ultimately would be ideal. Uh, this developer came to us um, with his project, and we haven't gotten his application yet. It came with his idea of what he wanted to do with his project and looking at what our draft plan was for the Farman's Landing area, which in the prior version that we had through um, our, our planning process, as well as the most recent version through the Parks and Recreation uh, master planning process included um, cutting off that, that uh, vehicle access to that area and looking at activating this in a more real air way to benefit the uh, economic development in downtown. This developer came to us and said, I have a real interest and need for my development, including patio area to push my building backwards and asked us about the opportunity to potentially acquire a portion of what was the ramp and the parking lot area from the city. Again, with the city retaining the waterfront area, the boardwalk, that access along the water behind that development. And he said in exchange for that um, and with the value of the property, I would be willing to give you some of the uh, right of way, additional right of way that you want for realigning the sidewalk along Bridge Street. Um, and in conjunction with the development of his building with our plan for farm and landing, it requires the retaining wall, the removal of the ramp going down into farm and landing, which would need to be accomplished in conjunction with his buildup of his building. Um, we are in the process with this again of getting an appraisal of our land at Farman's Landing to understand what this might look like but anticipate coming forward with a further discussion with council in this regard. Um, this again potentially would be a way to accomplish the Farman's Landing development with for or it not, would not be a full trade. There would be the value of the public right-of-way that the city would obtain to better align along Bridge Street, as well as the acquisition with that private developer pushing his development back some, but again, not full acquisition with the waterfront. What's anticipated with that would be there is would be an exchange, not only in terms of the exchange with us acquiring some of the property we need um, against the value of the property we have, but actually a cash exchange between the developer and the city, which would support the development of this Farman's Landing project and would enable us to move forward with the project uh, in the next two fiscal years as opposed to five or 10 years down the road. Much of the conversation we've had with Farman's Landing when we acquired that property and as we were doing the plans with this property was again, when and how are we going to pay for it? And this becomes a real way for us to get uh, the money to be able to make this development happen for the community in the near future instead of, again, this is potentially a plan five or year, 10 years down the road. And I think again, uh, it is an example of why 
master planning, including site planning is so important for us that we put out a vision and it gives us the opportunity to see um, how we might be able to craft that and lay out a vision for others to see and how they might fit into that vision, um, whether that be an outside grant funding source, whether that be a private developer with an opportunity for a public-private partnership. Um, but that is reflected in this plan. Again, this is not an approved development. This is not an approved exchange or sale of the properties. That too, like City Beach, would have to go through a full public hearing process for the council. But we did, um, in order to lay this out for both council and the public, want to incorporate in this vision so people really understood what that would look like. Um, In response to input that we received from the public and the businesses, um, adjacent businesses especially uh, for this waterfront area specifically and farm and landing, uh, while it looks like it is a full promenade uh, down there with kind of colored markings, colored concrete, whatever that would be, um, that's contemplated in the design, but what it accomplishes in the short run is retaining all of that pro all of that parking that is currently available to the public and to those businesses um, at that location, but providing an opportunity for a vision for the future that um, parking uh, could be moved from that area and we would move to ultimately a highest and best use of the waterfront. But what we've heard through discussions uh, with the public and again with the adjacent businesses is um, that is not a leap, that is not a step um, that many feel uh, is reasonable or warranted or desired at this point in time. So this plan contemplates accommodating what we have now but also a vision for the future that is a different use for our waterfront, which also would provide the, the uh, time ultimately for us to look at parking improvements, potentially the addition of additional parking lot down at the city parking lot site downtown. So um, that would allow for kind of a phase move uh, on that front. Uh, another change from what you saw in the last presentation is over at the parking lot along Sand Creek, so across Bridge Street. Um, in the last version that we had, it showed um, a commercial area, potential commercial area, and identified as kind of a secondary location for the carousel. In response to Councilwoman Rule's comments earlier, that's not ruled out as a site that could potentially accommodate the carousel, but what he's represented in this vision, and this is in response to outreach we had from several of actually our local businesses who uh, commented that if there was an opportunity for them to expand um, with kiosk space or some other commercial space where um, they would be able to offer recreational rentals, recreational sales, again, taking advantage of the waterfront, they would be interested in doing that. So that's what's reflected on this particular vision. Um, and then finally, what you see down below that in order to accommodate that pur purpose, and also in response to public input about the lack of opportunities for non-motorized launches on the water, kayak launches or paddleboard launches. Um, this particular uh, redesign includes uh, a non-motorized launch down below that area for kayaks, paddleboards. Uh, again, uh, council will be familiar, we do have the current kayak launch and that is still there in this depiction there along Farman's Landing. Um, but uh, in the springtime when, and fall when our water levels have dropped, um, it's actually not a usable launch. So um, there would be more opportunities there across from Sand Creek and also an opportunity to pair that with 
commercial use as well. And again, looking at that opportunity for potential of some commercial use there, which generates revenue that supports the maintenance and improvements to our park system into the future. Anything I missed, Ken? No, I think that's excellent. I think uh, the, the nice thing is the divide between the commercial aspect uh, on this side that we're talking about and then the non-commercial on the other side, other than the events and stuff. So it still kind of separates that. Uh, I think that's a really an underused uh, resource that we have uh, where the old lake site inside was for those of us who've been here. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Council? Yeah. Not, not peace? Mayor, I did. So yeah. The other restaurant that I really love is the Burger Dock. Yes. I'm, I, so I went down over the weekend and I, I tried to get a physical interpretation of this. I just have a tough time with space. That looks like a bunch, but that's that's just me. That corner where the Burger Dock is, is has always been problematic. And as I'm looking at this, that does not look like an accurate depiction of what that space is. Is and, and how incorrect am I? Where is the burger dock in this on that corner? The burger dock is right there. Yeah. So I just don't see that that parking space. And this again, this is just me. That the park it does not seem that 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 that's not, doesn't depict parking. That that depicts potential build out. Right. So not just in particular parking, but. But, but the property line. Okay, so okay. the burger dock is that that what? So the the burger dock is the is the white, white space. space. The white, yes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But again, this this uh, this concept uh, contemplating really activating the waterfront and the potential for property owners in the future to take advantage of the waterfront and extending their building structures or deck structures from where they are currently out to the end of their property line to take advantage of the waterfront. Another way of looking at it is how, what would happen if we just weren't looking at uh, first and developing that way, what if we swapped around and looked at the water, what kind of an impact would this have as people are coming by on the byway? Mm -hmm. you know, then instead of seeing the back of the panada and some stuff, you know, it's gonna actually be a uh, developed type of a welcoming, a pull off at the off ramp or something happening downtown. Mm -hmm. So again, trying to utilize our public property as an economic driver. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at again, long-term. How can we use this space, uh, not only for uh, water tr creep treatment, like Jennifer had mentioned, but also as an economic driver mm -hmm. and, and th th that everybody is, is known for years and years and years of this, a very underused space. But uh, this is an idea to bring us to that next level. And thankfully, the byway is such a nice investment to our community that we have a different view and look at this in a different way. And it's awesome. And those of us who live through the whole byway thing and now yeah. we've seen the benefit it is. And this is just kind of capitalizing on that. Yeah. You know, when you're on the byway and you look over and you're, and you're northbound, you look over at the beach, you go, wow, before the byway, there's a lot of people that came through Sandpoint had no idea we had. <laughs> You know, and now uh, you go by that's what you see. And so it's just kind of, it's elevated and saying, hey, look at what we have over here. And this is on the other side now. Mm -hmm. okay. if, the, if the area looks larger in farm and landing than, than what you think you see there uh, today, it's because what's depicted here is so it is actually bringing in fill and pushing out all the way to where the boardwalk is instead of that space that, a kind of vacant space that we have existing there. So that's why it, it, it looks larger. And um, that was built in number one, um, so that we have the space to, um, to be able to incorporate a robust treatment system for the, uh, for the stormwater, which is primarily uh, underground. Um, and then secondarily, just for community gathering, maximizing that space that's available instead of having that vacant space there. Smear. Yeah, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but it probably just now that two of my kids are uh, riding bikes, I'm noticing a lot more with uh, speed and texting and driving and all of that. And I have uh, a lot of concerns since we ride our bikes <coughs> to the beach all the time. And I have a six year old and a four year old now riding bikes. The stop sign, for whatever reason, the stop sign right before Starbucks going to the beach, people think that's just the time to speed. <laughs> and it's really bad right now. 
especially with the parallel parking right in front of the Burger Dock and um, Starbucks. Um, it's actually a really big concern of mine. And so I don't know if it's the right time to address it, but that's really bad of how fast people go from that stop sign all the way to turning into the beach or going right past it. It's just um, pretty, pretty dangerous in my opinion. What was that? Illegal. Yeah, yeah. And um, again, I don't remember doing this in high school. I know kids are trying to be cool, but like speeding at the beach, like I know you know, but like it's really bad. And I'm thinking more high into it because my kids are on bikes now. Um, but just let them know they're not cool. And that's not how you get the ladies. Um, so if we can just keep watch on that. Like I, I had to stop some people and they're my friends. And I warned them and they are my friends and they're younger. But I told them I will call the cops on you. And that's hard to say to a friend. So I uh, would just, I don't know what to do about that. But it's, it's been pretty bad lately. And I know they've been cooped up for a while. So, but I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. So when we had our meeting with the business owners back there, um, they were very concerned about their parking spaces, et cetera. And I, and I understand it. And then we'd also, I don't remember what Amanda said about, someone asked the question about fire being able to get without the ramp there, if that's gonna be easy for them or trucks loading and um, some of those questions too. And I, I don't remember the answer that you had. Also, would there be a possibility, and maybe this is a question for Aaron when I can meet with Aaron, you know, it, it would be great and ideal if those businesses would be able to put the money in to refurbish, remodel, make it look great. But um, we know that that might be virtually impossible for some of them. Is there any sort of like small town grant that people, if, you know, the developer on the end makes it look really great, is there any other like grants that maybe those business owners could get if we want them to, you know, refurbish their the back of their buildings to complete the look or I know we've been looking for opportunities and it really falls more Linda's um, our grants administrator and we've talked about the potential of grants for um, for facade improvements I know we have at least one of the businesses and property owners along that stretch that is is looking at doing a remodel of their building actually later this year and and improvements on the back to take advantage of the waterfront. We continue to look for those uh, economic development uh, opportunities. And again, we think having this vision really puts us in a better position to try to negotiate with funders, both private um, as well as, as public funders to try to leverage dollars to accomplish this vision. And we are looking for those opportunities in partnership again with private business too. So your point is very well taken. Uh, in terms of fire access, there had been a lot of discussion about that. Fire access relative to um, any fire at these, at these buildings would be from First Street, not from down below. And unfortunately, we saw that play out relative to the two buildings that we had there at Bridge and First when we had the fire. So fire was um, was putting out the fires and protecting adjacent properties from First Street. Um, relative to behind the buildings and access again with the, the push out um, of, of the usable space towards the dock, um, it actually pushed out the, um, the our parking area and creates some room for, for turnaround there. We had discussed that. And again, I'm, thank you for bringing that up because that, that property that is um, behind the buildings, um, that portion of the property that's kind of the, the brown property behind the buildings up to kind of that gray stripe that runs through, that's private property. So the city, the city doesn't own all of that property up into the buildings and and actually the pushing out addresses some issues that we have where actually ingress and egress down to that farman's landing parking area there from gunnings alley um, actually people are cutting across uh, private property um, we don't really have the turn radius actually on city property really effectively to accommodate the turns down there for that public parking so if a property owner was to push back or if a property owner was to take issue on that corner relative to cars kind of cutting across that property there, 
um, it would probably limit that access. So this, this ensures that that access remains available. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Council? All right, you have the next one, Kim. Okay, and, and uh, I can start, I, I can talk parks and rec parks all night, and I'm actually more excited about this plan, but in the efficiency of time, I'm gonna give you the, the two minute version of this one. Uh, what it does is uh, for the sports complex, it consolidates stuff. And so it consolidates tennis courts, pickleball courts, uh, in, enlarges the skate park. It uh, vastly improves the size of the parking for our events. And uh, it does include some elements of artificial turf uh, that's recommended. Again, this is just kind of an overall layout plan. And so we're not here to debate the artificial natural turf right now. Uh, it adds a couple of bicycle areas, one for the little guys there in proximity to the existing playground, and one uh, that is a little bit more west for young adult slash Kim track. So <laughs> that, that's where, uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell, is uh, again, the, the biggest part is, the, and the cool part for me is consolidation and economy of scale. Uh, we have all of our courts in one spot. Uh, we are looking there to the east side to possibly look at uh, where, where the red line is around there is uh, some, if we can come up with some uh, uh, funding mechanism for maybe some indoor courts, maybe half of those would be tennis, maybe half pickle. Pickleball has been, mm -hmm. been a big grower. And uh, so that's kind of it in a, in a, in a nutshell for that area. Uh, is any, as far as any other major changes uh, from the original plan, I think the, the add of the, the young adult BMX track there at the bottom uh, was it. Uh, consolidates the pathways. Uh, again, I'm a, it's an exciting thing, the parking we need, and because we have a lot of the, the, the larger uh, sports tournament, and this acreage holds literally thousands of kids when, when we don't have to be six feet apart and have scrimmages instead of games. <laughs> Any questions on that or? Is that I just had one comment, Quint, Kim. Whoa, whoa, getting late. Tongue doesn't work anymore. Um, that I think that this is a extremely appropriate space for the splash pad, and that I would love to see um, even a bigger type of thing um, in this area, as opposed to. Um, the only comment I didn't make about City Beach where I, I don't feel like the splash pad is necessarily appropriate down there just to keep it more of a natural area and you're surrounded by water. So um, to me and to um, many others that I heard from, they, they can't quite understand that. And then I think historically we had some sort of wading pool down there that eventually failed and we got rid of so um i wouldn't hate to see that mistake made so um very appropriate here when it's super hot and kids are on that side of town and maybe can't aren't allowed to go to the beach a great place to it pull would be off. very well used i, mm -hmm. I think it would be to our, our housing uh, yeah and and the safer access on a bicycle instead of fighting through downtown if you want yes. to pull off. so i, I really like yeah. that piece yeah. here and I also want to uh, remind those uh, watching and participating uh, online that these will all be posted on our site. And so you can go in and read all the details like I did on the first one on the city beach until, uh, until we're dragging on here. So all the detail for these are the, the, are the same as what the beach were. It's for ideas, go in and, and, and check them out. Uh, again, I'm super excited about the plan. Uh, I think the overall the site plans are, are positioning us to be uh, take opportunities for grants and foundations and donations and truly have a plan to move us for the next 50 years. Um, Kim, I, I got a question. So the young adult BMX track on the west side, is it, could that also be a, is that different than a pump track? Because we've heard a lot about a request yeah, for a pump track. Yeah, well, I think that we basically it identifies the area as bike stuff, right? right? I had a, a guy call me today, or a friend of mine that he was a kid, <clears throat> he's got kids, is that the, had a specific concerns about different types of features they would like there. And so those are kind of ever changing. But, you know, I would see it as is the, the little guy track. So if you're, if I'm taking my, my uh, grandkids to the playground to play and they can have a little bike and they can go over by where the little guy's bike park is. And then as they grow up a little bit, we'll go down to the other park and, and play there with grandpa. <laughs> Okay. Um, great. It's great. 
So, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, in yeah. terms of final comments, all of these are available on our website. Um, they're a part of the council packet, so they've been up since we posted the council packet last week. People can get in and and blow them up. And so, to Kim's point, better review the descriptions that we have from the landscape designers. There also is a narrative that was included in the council packet from the designer kind of explaining the what and why and and what drove the, the design at, at each of the facilities. Uh, tomorrow we will have posted up the interactive opportunity where it'll be in a blog fashion. We'll have these new updated um, designs included in there so the public can provide actual, you know, ongoing feedback, see feedback of others. So that will be the difference of what we're posting up tomorrow. These are available on our, our website now and we'll get the direct link to that blog uh, tomorrow up on the website so people can easily find it as well as on our Facebook page. And so we'll be pushing that out and we'll keep it open and through the plan coming back to council and through ultimately final plan in July, uh, coming back to council for adoption. So you have the opportunity to see um, all of the in public input that we have received. Um, and then finally, um, you saw our master plans tonight for three of our facilities. You will recall that we had master planning efforts identified in our parks plan for actually five sites. So these three sites, as well as War Memorial Field, and um, we are in phase one right now with construction of the field itself down at War Memorial Field. We are still uh, on time with that project. So anticipating completion of that on time, we are in design for phase two of that, which was the parking lot improvements, the boat launch improvements. So phase two concept plan will be coming to council in the very near future um, with again the intention of moving forward with phase two come this fall. Uh, and then finally the watershed. So um, we would be remiss if we did not address that as well. We are going through right now and it's been presented at a past council meeting um, an environmental review um, and structure for the watershed that will be coming back to council with a presentation probably in late August. We do anticipate once we have that structure, that tells us kind of the process and the what and the where for the potential for more trail development and realignment in the watershed. But we also intend as part of full-blown watershed planning uh, to move into a closer look around recreation and that potential in the watershed. And we anticipate that coming that really kicking off and happening as a more dedicated concerted effort in September of this year. So it hasn't been lost. It ultimately the watershed will not be a final part of this uh, parks and recreation master plan that will be coming in July, but it's not that it's off put off less of a priority. It was there's a lot of different things to consider with the watershed because again, it's our watershed, it's owned by our water funds. So all of that environmental assessment, timber assessment like we've done in the past, it's a more comprehensive plan beyond just recreation. So um, that's where that is. Um, we've also heard tonight um, a bit about some interest on changing policies around uh, dogs at City Beach. And I can tell you from a staff perspective, we hear from many people with the interest of dogs at City Beach. Um, on the other side, there is very strong um, input that we get regularly about keeping dogs out of the park. Um, not only City Beach, but our other parks as well. So, and dogs down at City Beach has kind of become an increasing enforcement issue for us this year. I know on uh, our recap that um, I get from from Police Weekly, we had two weeks ago, I think 19 um, warnings about dogs in the park in a two hour period. So um, we are going to be launching a community survey, really digging more into the issue of dogs and the where and the when um, related to our, our parks and dog parks. And as a part of this whole parks master planning, the mayor asked us to work on getting more information about that. So we plan on launching that survey um, in the next week. So um, you'll see that online with announcements about that as well. So 
Um, that will be as uh, I expect as interesting and involved project as field surface. So uh, here we go with the dog issue. So Great. that's okay. lots of happening. Okay, thanks. Um, I at this point, I'd like to open it up to the audience here. If there's anyone in the public that would like to comment on the last components that uh, we just went over with the Parks Master Plan and Jane Fritz, I see your hand up. Please come forward. <laughs> if you can keep it brief, that would be great. Excuse me, Jane Fritz. Um, I, I just thought I'd point out that some of the largest parks in our area, like look at McEwen Field and Coeur d'Alene, look at Nelson, BC, all accommodate dogs. Sandpoint is sort of noted as a dog friendly town, except for two parks. Traverse and City Beach. Traverse has is gonna it's gonna be an issue for the council as well because Chuck Slough is right there. And I live very close to the parks complex. I go there more than probably anywhere else. And um, I just really believe <laughs> that those animals can be accommodated. I'm a cat person, but what I hear from a lot of dog owners is, and what I see is that they're on the sidewalks everywhere. The Coeur d'Alene Parks and Rec director told me last summer that two hours of dogs being able to uh, walk or move around and you know he we were talking more about dog parks because they do accommodate they do have dog parks at some of the Coeur d'Alene parks um, is actually so much better than just walking them uh, through a period of time i'm not a dog owner so i don't know a lot about this but i just noticed that a lot of parks that i've researched around the dog issue around the geese issue they kind of go hand in glove um, you don't have a geese problem if you have a dog's present and I you know having lived here and gone to City Beach and actually during the time that I lived in Sandpoint then city limits uh, there wasn't a geese problem as I recall but the dogs were allowed at the beach now we've grown there's a lot of changes and but I, I really think that you'd be surprised how many people really like the idea how many people had suggested, and I can only provide anecdotes. I don't have public records to prove it, but we did provide some um, in our little petition last year. It was sort of tossed aside, I guess. There was at least one or two pages having people signed specifically for dogs. We didn't spend a lot of time. We spent one morning at, at City, at Farm and Park. So, but I also want to just make a comment about the plan here. Um, because I go down, I spend as much time in the winter in this park as I do in the summer. Now, I'm, I don't have children, I don't, I'm not a sports person, <laughs> I'm too old for that. But there is a lot of cross country skiers, a lot of uh, snowshoers that go through the park. I'm just wondering if some attention you know, why City Beach is being looked at as a year-round park? How come this one isn't? And um, it would, I, I would really like to see that happen. You know, some groomed trails for skiing. Um, there's definitely parking space. There's definitely people. Uh, it's just a very underutilized space in, this, in the wintertime. So I just wanted to I've been meaning to tell you that, Kim. <laughs> that, that's a good point. Thank you, Jane. Appreciate <laughs> those comments. All right. Uh, is Clerk, do we have anyone online that would like to comment on the parks plan? No, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I know we're three hours in here, but if the council can, um, you know, bear, bear through it, um, I'd like to get through the regular agenda. We've got two more items that should be fairly quick, and then we can take a, a brief recess before heading into executive session. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, here we go. The uh, next item on the agenda is a fire services operational assessment and feasibility study contract award. City Administrator Jennifer Stapleton will provide a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will be really brief on this, this item. 
Um, we presented on it previously about um, having a consultant come in and look at each of our individual agencies and our joint fire system and um, where we're at and looking at where there are opportunities, looking at staffing structure, looking at um, governance structure and providing feedback to each of the three agencies individually, um, but also um, looking at the system as a whole. So through the, the JPA board, we issued an RFP for these consultant services. We received five highly qualified um, consultant responses. Um, and so we're really thrilled by the responses that we re received. Um, this uh, item for council tonight uh, is a recommendation of an award to uh, the Fitch Consulting Group um, to uh, begin this effort with uh, this would be a process that would be completed by September 30th of this year. Um, the award and participation in the funding of this has already been approved by Westside Fire Districts as well as Sagal Fire Districts. So. Um, this contemplates just under a $45,000 contract with the three agencies as per our JPA agreement, participating in the cost share, a third, a third, a third. The contract would be with the city of Sandpoint and we would function as the project manage, manager in this effort, but in coordination with the two fire districts and then bill for two thirds of the cost to the two agencies. Great. Thank you. Any questions from council? I just have one comment, Mr. Mayor. I was extremely impressed. I have sat up here for many, many years and read through um, many of these and they were extremely detail oriented. I think we need this and I'm looking forward to what this company has to tell us. It was a very, very impressive um, um, RFP. Gosh, I can't even speak right now. <laughs> That's my bedtime. So thank you for bringing this together. Great. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, anyone else? Okay. Is there anyone in the public that would like to comment on this issue, either online or here in the room? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to the final item under the regular agenda. Yeah. We have to. Oh, your script is missing. I Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Um, okay, so I would entertain a motion to approve the joint resolution of the City of Council of the City of Sandpoint, Idaho, Sagal Fire District, and Westside Fire District. So moved. Uh, feasibility study. So moved. <laughs> Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Councilwoman Williamson? Yes. Councilman Espero? Yes. Councilman Grove? Yes. Councilwoman McAllister? Yes. Councilman Darley? Yes. Councilwoman Rule? Yes. All right, motion passes, and to be clear, that was uh, to select Fitch and Associates, Associates LLC to perform a fire services operational assessment and feasibility study. I hope that's what y'all voted for. <laughs> Good? Okay. Um, the last item on, uh, under new business is a request from Spot Bus for city funding in fiscal year 2021. Spot Executive Director David Sims will provide a presentation for us. Thank you, Mayor Thank Sims. You. Thank you, Council, for allowing me to speak to you tonight, and thank you for your support of Spot. I want to first start with just a little bit of history of Spot for uh, particularly the new, new council members. Um, Spot was actually started by the city of Dover in 2010 and started service in 2011. They got uh, stimulus funding, our funding to, to start the service. It was uh, uh, taken over uh, by a joint powers agreement between Sandpoint, Dover, Kootenai, Ponderay, Bonners Ferry, and Boundary County in 2016. Uh, the governance is spot is made up of a governing board uh, with representatives from each of the participant in the joint powers agreement. Uh, Sandpoint's representative is Zale Palmer. She's just a tremendous asset to our board. Uh, she serves as our treasurer and also the chair of our finance committee. Uh, spot provides a number of services um, in the area. The original services and, and re really the, the bread and butter of SPOT are the two fixed routes, the blue and the green route that operate between Dover, uh, Sandpoint, Ponderay, and Kootenai. 
uh, we have service between about 6.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. seven days a week. Um, I think every day is Christmas, so we're just, just about uh, 365 days a year. Um, in 2019, we provided 56,000 uh, rides on the fixed routes. We also have a curb-to-curb -curb paratransit uh, service that goes along with that fixed route for uh, individuals that can't use the fixed route because of disability. Um, that one is they schedule their rides and, and the bus goes right to their, their home and takes them where they need to go. Um, in 2019, we had 5,000 rides in our paratransit service. Our Boundary County service uh, started in 2015, and it includes two days of local service in Boundary County and two days where we bring people from uh, Bonners Ferry down to Sandpoint. Uh, we had uh, 2,900 rides in 2019. Then uh, we have started our seasonal mountain route service between the Red Barn and the Schweitzer Village. Um, last season, um, we had 52,000 rides on that service. And that was, we ended about three weeks early due to the pandemic. So a lot of rides there. The Boundary County service and the mountain service, uh, mountain routes, those funds are, are kept separately or counted for separately and the matches are, are uh, segregated for those. Uh, we also operate a van pool for Quest, which is self-supporting and doesn't use any local um, grant money and, and um, or match money or grant money. So it's completely funded by Quest. Um, 2019, we had 3,166 rides. And that brings people from uh, the Coeur d'Alene area up to the Quest plant in San Juan. Um, how SPOT gets its funding, um, it's really two things. We have the local match that the entities provide. Uh, the, the bulk of the funding comes from uh, FTA funds that flow through the state of Idaho. Uh, Idaho receives funding for rural providers such as SPOT based on the population of the state. And then SPOT applies uh, for funding every two years. And um, when we apply for funding with the state, it is a competitive process. We're competing with the other um, providers in District 1 and across the state. Um, our total budget for the coming year, 2021, uh, is 899000 and the budget for the blue green fixed route and paratransit service that Sandpoint provides match for is $594,000. Um, and the grants do require local match and the match rate is dependent on the class of expenses. The operating expenses such as our fuel and driver wages, um, the required match is 42%. That's the highest match rate that we have. And those items account for 70% of our budget. Administrative costs such as accounting, legal administrative wages, and off expenses um, require a 20% match rate. Uh, the maintenance costs such as regular maintenance, uh, cleaning, and repairs have the lowest match rate of 7.34, and that works out to 10% of our budget. So if you put all those numbers together, if you look at what your match uh, funds with SPOT, 86% of the match funds are used for operating, operating expenses, mainly driver wages and fuel. 12% uh, go for administrative costs, and only 2% are used for maintenance costs. I also wanted to talk about the COVID response. Um, the pandemic has reduced public transportation ridership across the nation, including here locally with SPOT. Um, our ridership dropped to approximately 30% of normal through the end of March and, and uh, through April. Um, and it is starting to rebound. We're at about 50% of normal though, uh, now. Um, <clears throat> actions that SPOT has taken, um, to uh, really protect, protect our drivers and also the public. Um, we've been following the FTA guidelines, uh, including more frequent bus cleaning with daily disinfections of each bus. Uh, we're using a disinfectant that the school district started using earlier this uh, fall, and it's really worked well for them. It has um, really decreased their driver absentee rate due to illness. <laughs> They've been applying it once a week and it's, it's a disinfectant that has a residual effect. Um, we've increased that frequency uh, twice a week. We use a electrostatic sprayer that coats all the surfaces inside the bus and then nightly the drivers use, uh, uh, apply it to the high touch surfaces. So 
We installed plexiglass shields on our fixed route buses just right next to the driver to protect, give them some protection. We were one of the first, I think the first provider in the state to do that. Uh, since we did that in, in March, we contracted with Northwest Auto Body to do that work. And uh, it's interesting because some of the major bus distributors are now offering a similar project commercially and, and people are installing that. Um, we've also uh, added touchless hand sanitizer stations for the uh, passengers inside the bus. So hopefully that uh, helps the, the safety in that regard as well. And then we have signs to remind and encourage passengers to social distance. So the, the, the phenomena of low ridership is again across the state and the nation. One of the things that Idaho Transportation Department is doing is they're forming an advisory uh, group made up of drivers to help uh, two things, develop best practices for operating with the pandemic uh, going on, and then also looking at ways to increase ridership as, as the pandemic subsides. And we, we have uh, four drivers in that group that will be starting probably in the next two weeks and they expect it to run about a month. And uh, ITD is funding all the driver's salary for that. The other thing that's uh, been helpful, FTA has relaxed some of the guidelines for the use of the buses. And one of the things that they're now allowing is for us to use buses for food delivery, which was, a prohib which was prohibited in the past. So we've been helping the Bonner County Food Bank with food deliveries to the outlying schools. We've been doing every other Monday and then Thursday, we've been doing some, some uh, uh, runs for that. <clears throat> So part of the other thing included in the CARES Act, um, ITD received a substantial amount of funding for the rural providers. Um, the CARES Act funding is what's uh, funding the uh, food deliveries that we're doing. Um, it has also uh, allowed us to decrease our match requirements. Um, as I included in the letter, our budget has increased by about 13%, and that's primarily uh, so we can offer more competitive wages for our drivers. We're below market, um, particularly when you compare us with the school district and the charter school. So we've really struggled historically keeping and retaining good drivers. So that was uh, when we applied for our current random grant funding, we included funds so we could uh, gradually increase its driver wages. But the, the board has decided to use the CARES funding to offset some of our operating costs next year. So we'll, we're actually reducing the amount requested from the local entities by 10%, which hopefully will help you with your budget. Um, the CARES funding that ITD has, it's kind of unusual for federal money and that it doesn't expire and it doesn't require a local match. So it's pretty very helpful and we're expecting that that funding will last between five and ten years for spot that we'll be able to offset our operating costs going forward i will say that itd has been pretty cautious about um, using those funds because they feel that we could have increased costs for some time due to covid so so our request to the city of sandpoint for 2021 is sixty-seven thousand five hundred. Um, last year and for a few years, you've been paying 75,000. That amount is the same as the city of Ponder A. We're, we're requesting the same amount from them as well. The other entities, Dover's uh, contribution, we're asking for 2,250 and Kootenai is um, $1,170. We also, for that fixed route and paratransit, we also get funding from the Area Agency on Aging. Um, they contribute about $18,000 to the Bonner County system. And that's on a per ride system for seniors. So we also have that. We also get a small amount from the Schweitzer Community Association and also the festival when it was operating, helped paid to help offset the service that we do. I'd also like to say that we're pleased that SPOT has been able to provide input for your uh, multimodal transportation plan. Uh, appreciate that opportunity and we also appreciate that Sandpoint has recognized the importance of transit in that plan. So, and again, we look forward to working with staff in making improvements to the service and the stops um, because we're here to serve your needs. So, any questions? Any questions from Council? Yeah. Um, I was told or since SPOT has started like how much it benefits local businesses and being part of one in town. Um, I've never heard any 
um, type of talking to businesses, how much they appreciate spot. I've never heard anything positive, um, personally talking to other business owners and quite often a lot of people. Um, have you ever done any type of data driven, um, we, conversations we, with business owners, how much money this actually brings in to Sandpoint and, you know, it's a lot of money and especially, you know, doing this year after year, I haven't seen anything like that. Just, you know, I can look at uh, spot contracted with a company called um, the report is called the shift report that was done in 2016, I believe that I believe has some of that data and I would be happy to pass that along so the council can see that. Um, one thing um, that I have recognized, I've been at the job for about a year and a half now, um, is that the routes were designed or or set up in right when starts uh, spot started, and I think there can be improvements uh, to help, uh, particularly the tourists in town. Um, really, I don't know that they're designed the the routes and the stops to optimize that. Um, so I think that's something that we're definitely open to looking at right. how we, um, how we can maximize sorry. the economic benefit. Yeah, because where I work, I see one, two, three, and I can just honestly say I'm not really impressed uh, with what goes on, and nor do I hear any positive feedback for downtown businesses, especially how much money we're spending. And I'm not saying we don't need help to help our elderly or right. um, those in need. I just would like to see before I can confidently support this uh, more positive feedback. And also, why don't doesn't spot charge like? Um, because with, with the funding formula, if you, um, charge a fare, it comes off your total operating costs and then your grant pays a percentage of what's remaining. So it, 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 the fare can't replace the match. The other aspect is the cost of collecting fares. For instance, city link in Coeur d'Alene has been fare free for perhaps since it started and they were going to go to a fair system about a year and a half ago and they put that on hold because the cost of collecting fares is really, really substantial. And they're not sure that that would make sense even at, you know, at mm -hmm. their size level, they do about 150,000 rides a year. You know why it's more expensive? Well, you have to have a system to either do it electronically or, you know, you don't want drivers handling <coughs> cash. So just that overhead uh, becomes very expensive. So if you look at the cost benefit, it, you know, the, the benefit just isn't there. It's from here I have to yeah. I am a huge fan of the spot bus. I was on the original team that designed the logo and in, um, got the name. When I attended a mobility conference as part of Sura in Boise, a uh, spot bus time and time again was called out as a great example of communities working together. I think the original intent was well, maybe to get people downtown, but was to move the people of Sandpoint and kind of get cars off the road. Parents are always saying to me, they're so glad that they can put their kids on the spot bus and get them up to Schweitzer. They don't have to drive to Schweitzer anymore. Also, we found it another kind of tourist when we're thinking about economy, because we have people who call the chamber and say, you know, we as a family, we don't go anywhere that doesn't have public transportation. And we never recognized that until we started to get these calls. So they are bringing people to town. And I think it's just valuable for the underserved to get to their jobs to if they don't have a car. So I personally think it's well worth the expense. If you look at the, the stops with the most traffic, it's... Um Kootenai actually is one of the higher ones, Walmart, the Bonner Mall, the uh, one at Jeff Jones, you know, the downtown and the library. Those are the, those are the highest stops. And then also close behind is the one at uh, Safeway, Fifth and Larch, and then the one over at just off of Super One off of Boyer there in Spruce. So definitely people are taking it. Most of those are commercial areas that they're going to. Again, mm -hmm. you know, Walmart, the mall, right. downtown, um, and, and then the grocery stores. And there are people that rely on it to get to work. There are people that rely on it to get to the grocery store. I think uh, also, you know, having grown up in the area, a lot of people think there's a car in my driveway. Why do I need to take the bus? But, it, you know, I think that is changing. And as Kate said, as, as you look across the state, um, ITD really um, 
oftentimes holds spot up as an example of a successful system in a small town. If you, if you look, you know, our fixed route ridership is in the 70,000 ride range, say, and CityLink is 150,000, you know, with multiples of the population. So. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, just yeah, a quick ahead. comment. Um, there's some beautiful roundabouts we just looked at at City Beach and that master plan. So maybe we can expand the spot bus routes there as tourism. And um, I'm just going to be quick. I know you don't even have to comment back. Um, and I think it's super important for our disabled population, our senior population. And not everybody has a car in their driveway, even if you're thinking about the environmental thing. And, and our town isn't always about bringing um, business into the downtown area. We also have a responsibility to take care of the citizens that work and live here and also pay their taxes and des deserve to be able to get to their jobs. Um, so I, I appreciate what Joel said about, you know, downtown business, et cetera. But I think it's a very important service to provide for our population that doesn't have the ability to um, own their own car. Certainly, as, as you interact with riders, uh, to me, the paratransit riders, uh, you know, are a minority of the riders, but for those folks, it's their only way to get out. You know, they're, some of them are using it to get to work, but some of it, that's... 5,000 rides, that's more than one a day. It's yes, a lot more than one a day, and you're speaking to a physical it. therapist, so... <laughs> yes. Thank you for those comments. Thank you, Mr. Sims, for that presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you for your patience. For sure. Oh yeah. I'll be, I'll be <laughs> Next time, bring a pillow and a sleeping bag. <laughs> um, is there anyone in the public that would like to speak on this matter? Anyone online? No, Mr. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve the sixty-seven thousand five hundred dollars in match funding for Selkirk Pottery Transit and include this amount in the fiscal year twenty twenty-one city budget. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Councilwoman McAllister? Yes. Councilman Spurrow? No. Councilman Grove? Yes. Councilwoman Williamson? Yes. Councilwoman Rule? Yes. Councilman Darling? Yes. <laughs> Motion passes. The final item on the agenda this evening is a decision to convene into executive session. I would entertain a motion to convene an executive session pursuant to Idaho Code 77-206B and 74-206F to consider the evaluation, dismissal, or disciplining of, or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent, and to communicate with legal counsel for the city to discuss the legal ramifications of and legal options for pending litigation or controversies not yet being litigated, but imminently likely to be lit litigated. Is there a motion? So so moved. Second. So moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Councilman Sparrow? Yes. Councilman Darley? Yes. Councilwoman Rule? Yes. Councilman Grote? Yes. Councilwoman McAllister? Yes. Councilwoman Williamson? Yes. Okay, we will now uh, proceed to convene an executive session after a brief break. And at this meeting, the Zoom meeting, uh, the Zoom meeting online will now end. So we will no longer be uh, accepting public comments um, or, or uh, discussion on, on any items. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.